What up, nerds, and welcome to another hot episode of Straight Chilling, the weekly horror movie review show where you chill and we kill, slice, dice, and chop up yet another horror movie. My name is Bomb, and I'll be your host for the evening. This is episode 460, recorded Sunday, January 28th, 2024. Tonight, we're talking about the latest from your boy, Barnaby Clay. The movie is The Seeding. Uh, before we get into it, let me introduce everyone else on the show. First up, calling in from Washington, D.C., we got your boy, Randeezy. What's up, man? What's going on, children? How do, Bobby? How we holding up? We about ready to get seeded. <laughs> Seed me, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a bump. I knew I could prompt you into something. <laughs> there you go. We got I'm an it. E I'm an easy <laughs> mark. I got to make it harder for you. This is not fair. <laughs> I just don't think that you're gonna. <laughs> no, I don't think that trying is gonna help. <laughs> that's also another bump. I got to make it harder for you. That's. I mean, I'm. I, know. I just Every, I can't like everything stop. you say. You are Tobias Funke, is what I'm gathering. I can't I can't you stop blow myself. hard. <laughs> I am blowing hard. Last but not least, calling in from Florida. We got your boy Soju. What's up, man? Oh, what up? It's your boy Beaver Moonstains. That's a third cousin of a Sherry Moon, I believe. <laughs> I can smell a beaver from 30 miles away. Beaver. <laughs> God damn. If if your boy Rob and Sherry had a kid, would they name it Beaver? Probably. After me? Probably. Probably. After, yeah. Leave it to Beaver. That's, that's, Beaver that's the aesthetic zombie. that Rob Zombie, I assume, will want to have in his lifestyle. <laughs> me and, me and Bob Zom are tight, you know? Bob Zom. Oh, wow. Oh, that's not my oh, boy, Bob Zom. You got, you got him a little nickname. That's cute. That's real cute. I had dinner in my boy Bob Zom's house. They <laughs> vegan, so it's a bunch of veg. Yes. <laughs> you know. You know. You know. Uh, yeah, we're talking about the seeding. Uh, we did actually just recently interview uh, Barnaby Clay, the director, writer, director, and editor of this movie, actually, uh, last week. That interview is in our main feed. Feel free to check that out. It's a spoiler-free interview, uh, so you don't have to worry about the seeding being spoiled. Um, but uh, this movie is currently on VOD everywhere, and it also has a limited theatrical run happening, so check out The Seating. Uh, before we get into our discussion, though, let's tackle just a little bit of housekeeping real quick there, gentlemen. Uh, anyway. This is your final reminder. Our February poll is currently posted on our Patreon website. The theme for February is Mad Romance. The movies you're voting on are From Beyond, Spring, and Byzantium. Bob, 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 Bob. For the last time, how those numbers looking? For the last time. From Beyond, still in first place with 52% of the vote. Byzantium's coming up a bit, 30%. There we go. Holy shit. All spring, right. last place, 17%. I'm just, okay. I'm never going to pick spring again. This is it. This is, I think <laughs> I've picked it three times now or so. It just keeps losing. It's, well, if Bob, the Lord I mean... wants you to watch spring, you're going to have to do it on your own time, I think. <laughs> People don't want to see it's it. Like it's... Casper. Eventually a Casper will get. <laughs> it will, yeah. Well, it's just, you know, just keep you picking enough times in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> just you keep know, doing it takes it. a few decades, and eventually those numbers will come up the way you want them. <laughs> eventually we'll run out of movies. Else. And you'll... Yeah, yeah. This, one, this is the only one left. So I guess we're talking about Casper and then spring, and then that's it. Um, Final get... episodes. That's it. <laughs> yeah. get, get those votes in. Uh, the time of this episode dropping will actually be the last day of the month. So get those votes in real quick and we'll see what movie we're talking about this February. Uh, in other Patreon news, we got mini cast dropping every other Friday as per usual. The next mini cast coming up is going to drop on Friday, February the 2nd. And mm -hmm. that's going to be a review for Salt Burn. Uh, your boy Soju and myself. Whoa. 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 That's a big oh. one. That's a big mm. one. Yes, that's what a boy likes. That's, yeah. 
That's what some boys like. Yeah, some, yeah. Lots of people should like that one. So, yeah, yeah. that was a fun conversation. Yeah, it was. Uh, we It's a longer mini cast. It, it was about 50 minutes or so. Oh, was there's, it? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, there's kind of a lot to, to get into yeah. with that movie. It's super fucking weird. Uh, I think it's really best to go into it not knowing anything about it. It's on Amazon Prime. Just put it on, watch it. Yeah, just know that there's a lot of weird sexual stuff. Well, That's the kind. <laughs> weird is subjective, Bob. Well, I mean, some might say on, normal Bob. sexual stuff. Not, not <laughs> vanilla sexual stuff. There you go. Horny, Barbara. Not Bob sexual stuff not, is what you're saying. Dude, not so <laughs> sexual stuff either. Let's, wow. We got into it on the mini Maybe cast. it's for me. Maybe it's going to be a <laughs> sexual awakening when I finally watch this film. I Randy, so. if you watch it and are like, Oh yeah, that's everything I've ever wanted out of the bedroom. We we are talking about it. I'm an executive by day and a wild man by night. Randy, we all know. Randy, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm telling your mother. Um, yeah, check that out over on Patreon Friday, February the second. In other Patreon news, we do have a brand new Patreon supporter. We got to give mad shouts outs to Hell big yeah. thanks to Derek B for signing up and showing us some love. Every dollar you guys contribute goes right back into the show. Really means a lot to us. Truly does help us keep the show going. And as is tradition around these here parts, we owe Derek B the straight chilling salute. This one goes out to you, Derek. Slap my ass. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Thank for the mighty slap, Derek. We appreciate a salute fit for the movie Saltburn, no doubt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hashtag appreciate you. Appreciate appreciate you. Uh, that's all we got for Patreon. Do you guys have anything you would like to plug? I do. By the time this episode is out, this previous Monday, uh, looking back, there was a brand new Creature Comforts that was dropped, and that was me and Shaboy Dan talking about um, the conversation from 1974. So uh, this was a Francis Ford Coppola film that came out right after The uh, the Godfather, actually. So, Ooh. yeah, sandwiched in between the two Godfathers, actually. And... Um, I don't know how accurate this is, but Gene Hackman said it was his favorite role that he ever did. So, and the it's IMDb definitely one of his most trivia. iconic. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Although and I haven't I'm... seen it, like that's definitely a movie that's been a, like his name yeah. and that movie are inseparable. <laughs> yeah. And that movie um, has a reputation for being fucking, you know, incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's what's crazy that so you say that. I I didn't really know much about it and then as I had to look into that movie, I found out that it does have a huge reputation, but it is kind of that one was like, "Oh, but I've never seen it." Like stuff like it, you know what? It's like um I think I say this a couple times throughout. It really kind of has the vibe of what a lot of like Hitchcock films kind of have where it's on that verge of horror, you know, or it definitely could be yeah. discussed in the realm of horror easily, but I just never see it brought up. In the horror realm, you know, I don't know. I, I, it was a really I good had no film. Idea. Yeah, it was really. I good. genuinely had no idea that it had any horror elements at all. I thought it was like a political thriller or something. But yeah, it's like it's a lot of paranoia. Um, it's huh. uh, so okay. the premise. Yeah, the premise is there's this uh, guy who is a specialist in like wiretapping, spying on people essentially, and mm -hmm. um, he's just naturally kind of paranoid because of the nature of his job. And then he he's like working on these clients, and then he like thinks that like maybe something nefarious might be going on. So it's like a lot of paranoia. Like, so yeah, I don't know. It's it was cool. It was impressive uh, to me. Well, of so, course, here come the demons. <laughs> yeah, we had a really good discussion about it too. So appreciate Dan Excellent. from Don't Believe the Hype. Uh, which is the Arctic Monkeys podcast I was featured on last month. So yeah, check them out as well. Red. You pulled my cord, so I have to say, who the fuck's Arctic Monkeys? There you go. <laughs> you need could, that bump. Could need you that say bump. it's a uh, it's a poly sci fi movie, perhaps? Um, what the no. fuck does that mean? No. I don't fucking know. I'm just I'm just <laughs> out here. To... Oh, like like po political science. Okay, yes. I was thinking P O L Y. Yes. Like it's like actually yeah. poly as a sexuality. I was like, no, damn, Gene, no get political, it. yeah. Political. It's not political at all. I think the only thing that like lives in people's minds about it being political is it can't it just so happened just luck would have it to come out around like the Nixon stuff. So mm. that's I thought that had something to do with that. So that, that makes sense. No, just yeah, sort of, like, just concurrent. it was one of those things. Yeah, like our boy Frankie, who just like dropped something at the perfect time, you know. Man, boy Frankie. You just... <laughs> boy Frankie. 
I want to say things, but have people have no shadow of, <laughs> of, of a chance of understanding what I'm Franklin saying. Rich and that's our, our boy Franklin. <laughs> I'll never forget. Like that is our whole mo. I mean, Jesus Christ, I true. remember it's vividly true, yeah. you telling us we had the old tin. Yeah, remember I mean, that? come on, Bob. We, at the people you were speaking this language to, had no fucking idea what you were talking about. We got the old ten. For those, yeah. ten, for those who have no idea what's going on, which is everyone, that was Rob's way of saying we have ten minutes until class starts. <laughs> we got the old ten. Well, boys, what looks the fuck? like we got the Does old ten. <laughs> yes. I mean, it made sense to me at the time, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. That's why we needed to go to class real bad. <laughs> real fucking bad. <laughs> Um, the, the last little thing I want to throw in here is your boy, Joe Bob Briggs is coming back with a double feature for Valentine's day on shutter. <gasps> I know, uh, he's doing that Friday, February 9th, and we're going to be hosting a watch party per usual. Oh, yeah. Uh, so check that out. It's going to start 9 PM Eastern, uh, Friday, February 9th. And, uh, if you do want to join the watch party, I'll send out a link so you can do so. It's going to be on all of our social media platforms. Nice. I'll say I usually send out maybe like 15 minutes before show showtime starts. Uh, so keep an eye on that and uh, join in on the fun. Watch whatever movies he's showing and chat with the squad. Sounds yeah. like a blast. There nice. you go. Everybody clean. You got your I, assholes clean. Or I no? did for I did forget to mention uh-huh. sp- talking about secret language. I did forget to mention that you can listen to our conversation exclusively on the Straight Chillin YouTube page. Thank you. There I'm nice. You All right. All right. That <laughs> we finally job. picked up the last of it. We got it. I All gotta right. redo that bump with the skin and marink this house in there. <laughs> This house, house is, is clean. clean. <laughs> <laughs> In this house, we clean. All right, let's get into the main event. We're talking about the seating, and we're kicking it off with the back of the box. What's on the back of the box? <laughs> Larb? Bob? Hi. When are you going to order this box? Uh, Whenever you can. I don't, I don't SAP, see a pre-order huh? yet. Yeah, so re- remains to be seen. Uh, the Seeding is a new movie written and directed by Barnaby Clay. Your boy, Barney. Your boy. Yeah, it's my, soon, yeah. Got my I boy Frankie, my boy like Barney. That, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, uh, it's got a runtime of an hour and 40 minutes. It stars Scott Hayes, Caitlin Scheel, Alex Montaldo, and some other folks. Plot synopsis brought to you by... IMDB is as follows. A man finds himself trapped in a desert canyon with a woman living off-grid who is captive to a pack of sadistic boys. Bunch of yo-yos! Bunch of fucking yo-yos. Uh, General Mangs, we'd all seen this once before, I know, because uh, it was one of the festivals last year. Be Fun? Be Fun was Be the fun. first Be fun, one, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so we watched it I last think more than one. July, yeah. I think, um, mm-hmm. and I did a little write-up for this movie on our website back then. Uh, we have all uh, been able to, to re-watch it since then, um, so not a first-time watch for us. Would you fellas recommend folks check out The Seating, Ray and Deezy? Kick us off. Um, yes, I would. Uh, we've um, had some discussions about this already, not just on that post that Bob mentioned, but we talked with Barnaby last week, spoiler free, as Bob mentioned, and it only kind of solidified that I definitely think this is a, a flick worth watching this year. So, yes, firm. Firm, yes. Juice, mm-hmm. what about you? Uh, yeah, what I would say is the seating is definitely a haunting tale that takes root in the soul. Um, so boys, my goal today is are to... you sneaking in AI prompts or something? No, shit? no, I'm okay. I'm sneaking in. I gotta get on the box. Here's my goal. I gotta get a soju <laughs> quote on the box. <laughs> on the box. Oh, oh, oh. It okay. takes hold my... of your fucking soul. <laughs> my whole goal is to get on the box today. Um, but no, I, I would. I would uh, you know, we mentioned this before a couple times, you know, it was a recommendation for us. Um 
at the end of our 2023 list, upcoming movies. Uh, I mentioned it with Barnaby when we did the interview with him, but this was in my top 10 list for 2023 until I found out it wasn't going to be coming out in 2023. So, um, yeah, it, it would have stomped, you know, some of the, even my favorite films that came out last year. Goddamn um, stomps. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Annihilated. See Onyx. Um, Onyx but, is getting that's, that's stomped. That's the box quote right there. It would have stomped my favorite films of the previous year. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but uh, but yeah, I would recommend people check this out. Absolutely. And so far, 2024, it's the best horror film out this year. So there you go. <laughs> wow, there you go. Uh, yeah. the, like Hyper two <laughs> movies. <laughs> Bob, would you recommend people check out the seating? Yeah, totally. For sure. Um, I, I definitely was a fan of this when we watched it last summer, and I think it holds up quite nicely. Um, it's fucked up. It's bleak, um, but in a good way, in a way that you want your horror movies to be. Uh, so definitely check this one out. If you can catch it in the theater, I would recommend watching it in the theater. Uh, but if not, watch it at home, you know, turn it up loud, throw it on, enjoy yourself. Um, sounds like a pretty solid recommendation across the board from the straight chilling crew. We are going to be spoiling the shit out of the seating. And here comes your warning. Spoiler warning. Bob, do you have that plop synopsis? I do. Oh, yeah. He does. Here it is. We're hunting for dick. It's <laughs> 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 <Well? laughs> so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. Well, you, well, you did. Um, <laughs> Bob, go ahead and hit us with that plop synopsis. All right. All right. Here you go. So the movie opens up with a child in the desert eating a human finger. We then meet our main character, Wyndham Stone. He drives into the desert and takes photographs of the lunar eclipse. He finds another child who claims to have lost his parents. Wyndham tries to help, but ends up just being led deeper into the desert, and he eventually gets lost. He happens upon a large canyon with a cabin at the bottom. He hears a woman singing, and he climbs down a ladder to ask to use the phone. She has no phone, but offers him a meal. Uh, he attempts to eat it, but the meat looks kind of weird, so he pushes it away and just drinks water instead. He ends up staying the night. The following morning, he tries to leave, but the ladder is gone. Wyndham then tries to climb out of the canyon, but someone throws a severed pig head down at him. Uh, he ends up falling, and he gets knocked out. When he wakes you up, you can't he... piss on hospitality. I won't allow it. <laughs> you certainly can. Uh, when he wakes up, he finds uh, his pick has impaled his leg. The woman pulls it out and cleans his wound. He is injured, but he's able to hobble around. The woman's very shy, a bit cagey. She doesn't offer any context for their situation, but says she can feed him and take care of him. A kid appears at the top of the canyon and says he can pull Wyndham out with a winch. He throws a rope down and Wyndham ties himself off. They hoist him up about halfway and then stop. They let him dangle in the sun for hours. Another kid ends up peeing on his face. He wakes up. They start shaking him around. And Wyndham eventually cracks his head on the side of the canyon wall and passes out yet again. He wakes up the following morning in the house, and the woman says the kids are just a bunch of strays that the desert has brought together. Uh, the kids lower down some supplies, including two chickens, some gasoline, and a bottle of whiskey. Later that night, Wyndham gets hammered and has sex with a woman. The next day, Wyndham plants some seeds, and another kid named Lepus appears, asking what he's doing. Wyndham offers to teach him all kinds of cool things if he can just get him out of the canyon. The kid says he will return with some rope, and the woman ends up telling Wyndham that she is pregnant with his child, and he's not super stoked about that. Fucking well, idiot. The following morning, Lepus, the uh, the Lepus kid, uh, is is found strung up across the top of the canyon, and is, if not dead, he's certainly dying. Uh, the woman is very upset and ends up yelling at all the other kids. Uh, she knocks Wyndham's ass out and locks him in a cage. Uh, the kids and the woman have a wild ass ceremony around a bonfire where she wears a necklace full of penises and breastfeeds the boys. Uh, Wyndham tells the woman he has now chosen a life with her and wants to live in the desert and raise their child together. The woman says he has no choice. She then starts birthing her child. She opens the cage and lets Wyndham out. She lets him hold the newborn baby girl. The woman says she will love her and raise her to become the new mother, which will then fulfill all of her own purposes. She takes the baby back, looks at Wyndham, and says he too has fulfilled all of his purposes. And shortly after that, one of the boys sneaks up behind him, 
cuts his throat and he bleeds out to death. The movie ends with Wyndham's corpse rotting in the desert sun. Roll credits. Yeah. All right. Upbeat. I got to uh-huh. immediately ask a question because your synopsis said something that I hadn't somehow not noticed twice yeah. in a row, uh-huh. which is the penis necklace. I, I, I didn't I notice know. that either. It's are you sh- you're sure about that? Because I missed it twice now. Me too. It is like a couple frames. It's r- okay. real quick. I real it. quick. And I was not clear for sh- like at least my memory of that scene is that it was ambiguous whether or not it actually happened or if it was a. Uh, hallucination. Oh uh, yeah, because it, it is play out kind of like a dream. But um, I think you can go either way. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. I think it is ambiguous one way or the other. But like whether or not it did, I definitely didn't notice that bit. So yeah, uh, thank you for either. letting me know that. That's Bunch of severed dicks on a necklace. Damn, it's, I have uh, to go back and check that out real quick. We uh, are <laughs> hunting for dick. Yeah, well, nice and clean a, that time. She's got her trophies. <laughs> we got a cleaned up bump there, Randy. Here we go. Um. <laughs> yeah. Now, one thing I I remember as I was going back to revisit this is when I watched it for the first time at Be Fun, I remember like texting you guys and be like, okay, I just watched this movie and it's got the vibe of like the hills have eyes mixed with Midsummer, which I think still kind of like holds up in a way. Um, And one of the things that's like kind of interesting is like when we did the interview with Barnaby, I was asking him like, oh, you know, like, is there any like specific folklore tied to this? And he was like, no, not specific. Like I wasn't necessarily referencing anything, but you've got these kind of like paintings on the walls of this Mm -hmm. woman most of the time in kind of like this snake like form. And then you also have these chapters, which really help us like move through time. But it's got that kind of I don't know. It it still kind of reminds me of like the tapestry from Midsummer, and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, like they're there for like a specific time of the year where like traditions happen and stuff like that so i I think that still kind of like holds true in my mind of like which is an interesting blend of you know movies i mean even in midsummer that stuff was invented so it's not like it's outside of the realm of possibility that like he just oh no yeah he found some like parts like obviously there's a little bit of like you know like i think it's just like culturally known stuff that he kind of pulled from like Mm -hmm. like wiccan stuff that like or whatever or, you know, uh, like nature worship sort of things and mm-hmm. you know, all that shit to sort of emphasize the, the like cycle of life, which is clearly the center of this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, but it's like the fact that it's ambiguous what the individual components mean, like what all those items on the plate that we see multiple times in the in the in the interstitial cards like those. Mm-hmm. Um, can like the mystery of what those are, it doesn't need to be answered at all because we know ultimately what it, it amounts to. But it just like the fact that it is oblique makes it like just it feels like the mystery is still there. I, I saw mm. some complaints of this movie about the mystery being telegraphed from the beginning, and I'm not sure I agree with that. Mm. Um, mm. no, not necessarily. I, I, I personally don't really get midsummer vibes from this because like the main thing that I get from midsummer is like it's a bright, sunshiny spring day, and sure, everything yeah. is lush and green and pretty, but there's really awful stuff happening under the surface. This is a more like isolated kind of movie. And I do think perhaps if we would have spent more time like above ground with like all the kids and what Mm. they, they live in what they refer to as the palace. Like maybe we would get some more Mm. uh, background information and like, it might feel a little more midsummery in that way. But I, I don't know that the movie needs that, but I am like insanely curious as to like where they live and how they live. They have their own language that it turns out the woman also speaks. Like, how did they develop that? How long has this been going on? Cause we like, she references the original mother. There's a, there's like a portrait of her in the house Mm -hmm. and the baby girl that she gives birth to is going to be her successor. So like how many generations has this been going on? And like, why it's like well, how did yeah. this start man it's yeah. really interesting a lot of questions well, to, to chew on and like they have some modern stuff but you don't know whether mm-hmm. or not that modern stuff came as a result of i don't know of uh, of just the their victims like you know foraging from their items like mm-hmm. the, i'm sure that wyndham's car was brought out to the desert a to conceal his disappearance and b to use for whatever purposes the kids had or the woman have for it like they have Coca Cola coming from somewhere, so mm. I don't know. Like I think that there's something like still sort of mysterious about it. Like you said, like I, I think they leave open enough like doors for you to sort of travel down in this that you don't necessarily need to have every answer. I do think it's fairly clear, relatively early on, what his role is to her, 
but we don't know what her relationship is with the boys that mm. easily. Like we don't, I don't know that we get like the full picture and I don't think we really ever do. So the idea that there's no mystery in this uh, early in the movie just doesn't really track for me. Yeah. I guess if the only thing that you would consider the mystery is like, like w- why is he specifically down in the Canyon is like, you might be why able to assume leave, yeah. you might be able to assume like, okay, well he's, he's going to have sex with this woman. And then, and that that's where these boys are coming from. But like, that's, I don't know. Well, the like, name there's... of the movie's the seeding. I don't even yeah, think it's hiding it, that, really. Yeah, like, it's I not. Think it just yeah. takes a few minutes to figure that out. And maybe that's the mystery people feel like was like too obvious, but there's mysteries on top of that. And they're like yeah, a lot, the ambiguity yeah. of, yeah, and a lot of them are like, that, to me, it's not, they're not mysteries that need to be answered. They're ambiguous mysteries that are like unknowable to you, whose uh, point of view character is the guy who can't know any who's of this in a pit and is figuring it <laughs> yeah. out yeah. <laughs> bit by bit and doesn't know the name of the movie is the fucking seeding he doesn't yeah. know that <laughs> so i don't know like you're, if you put yourself in the shoes of your lead character as as i did like then i don't have a problem with that mm-hmm. that yeah. poor dude is so fucked um, like the first time i watched this as soon as he started following that kid in the desert i was like this dude's so fucked he's just so Man, <laughs> that kid, there's a couple of standout performances he, from the kids, but that yeah. first one looks sets like a system it up. of a down music video. <laughs> Man, he's such a little shitty kid. Like, you know, he dumps the water out or he's like, <laughs> don't touch me or whatever. He leads him around. Oh, man, he's a uh... Randy. <laughs> Randy with the burn. He's the Ariel's music video. No, <laughs> yes. I mean, not to burn the kid. But like he's got like that same menacing energy, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I yeah for know. sure. He's, yeah, there's it's something that, about it. It's great. It's yeah. got that well, that Lord of the Flies vibe going yeah. for it, where like you know, most sorry. most of the movie you're not like spending time with these kids, but it's got that vibe, and it's like that that sort of reoccurring like question that's just really uh, awful to ponder. But it's like when when all like social norms and social constructs are like stripped away, like folks just revert to like their most like nasty and ins- like base instincts. And like, it's mm-hmm. sad to see it in, in Lord of the Flies and in this movie, but like, why, like, why is that? Is that just straight up human nature? Like, it's just, I don't know. It's well, fucked it's up. Debatable well, if it's debatable. That's not even, even like there's been sure. a lot of people like are, and, but like within certain enclaves of isolated peoples, there's all kinds of different ritual and belief mm. and all yeah. that sort of thing that keeps things going down a certain track. And yeah. a lot of them do sort of mirror each other in a lot of ways there's 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 not like a universal standard i don't believe in that personally but there is a lot of things that share similarities because of the way human beings react to things like uh a childbearing woman or whatever like and like the anything any anything that has to do with like the standards of life that people live in if they're isolated and having to make sense of it themselves that sense can make no sense to somebody across the world and still make perfect sense and i think that's kind of like one of the things i like about this movie is it feels like that it feels like Mm. i'm seeing a documentary about an isolated people that have like made the facts of life make sense for them and it's a really brutal way of understanding it because they live in brutal conditions well, even going off of that, yeah, if the boys are, I mean, the implication I feel like that we get later is that, as you said, this has been going on for generations, and I feel like she lies, that these aren't strays, that these are the kids, because, you know, she even says, this is, like, not how brothers act or treat each yeah. other or whatever, mm-hmm. and so this is their community and so it's a very interesting thing because he was saying he pulled a lot and he was inspired a lot from the idea of nature and and even the idea of you know he was saying that um he like a termite's nest or a hornet's nest or something like that of there's this queen and it's just yeah it's not the social norm that we consider but this this woman is like lives to be served by her family to continue the family to keep it going and they bring her what she needs like you would see you know in a bee's nest or hornets or mm-hmm. something like that that's the where everything in the community serves to protect and serve this one being that guarantees they will to continue on and like i mean yeah. i have seen you know it's biological there's, imperative yeah there's the i mean and and it's mm. it's very interesting in a way that he approached this too because i have seen like the the documentary stuff sometimes there's um some forms of is it ants or bees or something where like a male will literally like be one that has wings and he just kind of flies in and he's not from the nest and mm-hmm. 
the the soldiers or whatever have to like accept him in and then once they do they essentially pull his wings apart and just like haul him into the inner sanctum of the you know of the nest or gotcha! whatever yeah and he's just a prisoner there to me and then be eaten or killed once that's done oh, and like damn but that's like a you know i mean but as a form of being inspired by nature it's interesting to see that yeah. fleshed out in a societal way of this is how we function you know this is yeah. how how we live and continue to live and it works for them so very very you know, interesting you, you we have talked about how like you talked about how it was comparable to at least for us midsummer and um the hills have eyes and aesthetically mm -hmm. i think hills have eyes certainly but like to Rob's point earlier, like I don't necessarily see it setting wise in Midsummer. I see it in theme and in a similar yeah, way, so. I see some themes. I was thinking about this today in Misery that feel like they play with some of the mm. stuff. This isolation is a like there's there's no shortage of isolation in horror movies. Right. But like this mm. is somebody being held captive, somebody who the person holding them captive wants something that only they can provide in this situation. And it's interesting to me thinking about those two because they're just like like diametrically opposed in terms of setting, and it's that's that I think is kind of interesting. But ultimately, they are talking about like holding somebody captive because they have something to offer, and then ultimately they don't need to be there anymore once they've offered that up. You know, and if you remember yeah. Misery, spoiler alert for Misery, it, <sighs> you know, Annie Brandy. Wilkes is trying to. Uh, get him to write this book, not just for so that she can read it, but also so she can take over the role of the writer of the misery novel. She wants his life. Yeah. And so like, mm -hmm. that's like, she's, it's another movie that sort of like plays with the idea of taking life from somebody who you have entrapped and ensnared in this way because they have that to offer. And it seems like this is, but like, this is tied into like the cycles, like the natural, not, not natural order. I hate that term, but like just, like natural processes being made sense of by this, you know, this clique of kids mm -hmm. and uh, this generations of, of people that only have ta tangential relationship with the outer world and clearly don't really approve of it, except for we do see, um, I forget her name, the, the, the woman in this movie, but see her react really positively to music on the radio in that one video clip that she yeah. gets to see over mm -hmm. and over again, like giddy. So I don't know, like there's like, I don't know if there's a desire to break that system or not. Cause it seems like in every other way, there's not like, do you guys feel that way about like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and it could be one of those things that like, she doesn't even know it exists and, and it doesn't seem like she necessarily has a desire to go seek those things out. It's just this um, strange curiosity to her that is, mm -hmm. Oh, that's funny. And it is the one time that they actually kind of like laugh together and stuff. Cause mm -hmm. even when they end up having sex, it's not, you know, he's very drunk and it's that moment too, which I love that this flips the ideas kind of on its head. He's, He's been kind of like demasculated, kind of humiliated by the kids and things like that through several times. And he kind of throws this tantrum where he's like, mm -hmm. he says something like, I'm not a boy. You can't like command me when to go yeah. to bed or whatever. And I'm, a she, man. I'm a I man. I go to bed when I wanna. <laughs> and, and she's she, like, oh yeah, there's other ways to control you. And yeah, and, and then she things. just she just kind of like switches gears and still gets what she wants, no problem. Because she does. There's a, a moment earlier where she kind of like slams the bottle down. She's like enough, and she kind of like puts her foot down. Then he gets humiliated, and then you know he starts yeah. throwing a tantrum, or whatever. So it's just. It's very, I think it's very well constructed to see the kind of this guy from another society and the way he thinks about things and the way he thinks about his role and his life and things like that get like broken down systematically from this group mm -hmm. that absolutely knows what they're doing mm -hmm. for a kind of singular purpose. Um, and I, it's just, it's each time I've watched it, so I, I ended up watching it three times. Um, and it's fun to like kind of see that breakdown when you know it's like definitely coming of like this next step, this next step, this next step. Um, I thought they handled that well. She uh, mm -hmm. she she cut him off from the whiskey because she didn't want him to get that whiskey dick, you know. Oh yeah, it ruined their whole plan, right? <laughs> something something that I found really interesting in this to, to sort of like touch back on like the isolation aspects of this movie is like, and I, I could very well be just like projecting this onto the movie. I tried to touch on it a little bit when we were talking to Barnaby uh, during the interview 
Um, but he, he, uh, so isolation is like obviously a big aspect of this movie. And there seems to be like, I think in, in present day, as well as in this movie, there's sort of like a byproduct happening uh, via isolation. That's sort of this like lack of empathy. It seems, it seems like empathy is sort of like a, a becoming a more rare commodity these days. So everybody's like so interconnected via the internet, but like you, it's almost like a chosen isolation present day where in this movie, it's very much obviously a forced form of isolation and these boys are like so uh, uh i don't know they have, they have absolutely no empathy for sure but the the one amongst them that does try to help because he feels a little bit bad they string him up and kill him and they just sort of like mm -hmm. they, they sort of um probably quite literally eat the weak because like they are cannibals in this movie so i think they they probably literally eat the weak. And there's just sort of like, I think a correlation happening with this lack of empathy in this movie and what's happening like in present day. Um, and, and I think when we were talking about the movie with Barnaby, he did, he did touch on like people sort of like, you know, addictions to, to electronics and the internet and, and stuff like this. We didn't quite get into too much of like the lack of empathy, but that's something that I kind of latched onto when I was watching this, that just, it really like resonated with me. Did you guys feel any of that when you were watching it? I mean, like lack of empathy, and what from from whom is from, from the kids, the boys, the guy. yeah, the boys, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they do, like. There's no connection to like he's he is ultimately cattle to them. Like that, sure. that's how I kind of took it as well. Yeah. yeah, I think they see him as very important within the system that they have built for themselves. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing this. Like they have no, as far like as individuals, they have no reason to go out of their way to help this woman to like not you know, abuse her in some way to mm -hmm. find her, this man and like help her plan come to fruition or what her, her prerogatives come to fruition, except for the, for the quote unquote good of the society that they've built. That's the other reason that they string up the kid. Loudy, Ludi, something Lepis. like that. Lepis. Lepis. Yes. Lepis. Thank you. Um, So they string up Lepis because he stepped out of line and that's like yeah. the mm -hmm. microcosm of society that he, he's in. Mm -hmm. So I think there's like a, a lack of empathy, but it, I think it, I don't know that it's more or less than in our world necessarily. I think it is just a microcosm of it. It's like, well, if you step far enough out of line of the natural order, quote unquote, as directed by the leaders of our society, you can have your life completely upended. That's why some people yeah. go to live off in isolation themselves. That's why some people mm -hmm. choose to do that. And like well, these boys and this woman, they are clearly choosing that. They have the opportunity to leave. They have a car, and this is not the first car they've had at their disposal. They've had, they have access to the outside world if they wanted to pursue it. But that is part of their society is that they don't engage with that shit unless it is part of their quarry. Yeah, I just to give a little um kind of trivia, I looked up the name of Lepis because I think it's the one. I think it's the only kid who's actually named. And yeah. did they did they give the woman a name? I can't. So remember. her name is Alina, but I don't know that they ever actually say it in the movie. Okay, so I didn't look that up, but Lepis has a meaning of researcher, freedom lover, highly sensitive, which all applies in the very mm -hmm. limited time that we get from this kid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. because he's interested in learning. He is like kind of tempted by the idea that this guy's going to take him away and mm -hmm. you know he has the empathy or whatever toward the guy but um but yeah i didn't necessarily latch on to the idea of the empathy it really i was like tied to this idea of these boys have this role and they serve that role and even what seemed to me like um torture I, again, like I mentioned before, felt like it was this systematic way to break down the way this man sees himself in order to serve the cause. Because one thing to kind of reference to, I think I just in your plot synopsis, Bob, I think a correction that might be important for the kind of themes going on here is <laughs> it's a solar eclipse where the moon ah. goes in front of the sun, right? And that's kind of important because I feel like the idea, all of these chapters, they help us like go through time, but they're based on lunar cycles, which is not really a calendar we adhere to much you know, in the States. Um, but even the idea of like starting this film off with like, if we take it as the sun, as a masculine, the moon, as a feminine, she like is eclipsing him, you know, like she in this society, she is going to like eclipse him as like the important 
what you know the top the head or whatever and and these boys pissing on him hurting him breaking him down even the guy because the one kid says like in one of the first interactions like i can't wait till i finally get my time with you like he knows he has to wait he can't hurt him and she even respects the rules like she says you know, we allow people to stay here until the children are born. Like her even handing the baby to him is part of this kind of ritual, these rules that they respect and follow. And then he's killed. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of what I, I wasn't necessarily thinking like, oh, they they really have a lack of empathy for him. I saw every beat as a way of breaking him down for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. I kind of do see both myself because like there's definitely that I think that's like you're right because they can't they can't kill him right away and they also can't reveal to him what his purpose is to them. That's why she's so quiet like that. Yeah, they, they have to slowly like they have to like pretendly pretend to give him an olive branch here and there and then like keep him there by fear and then have that fear metastasize in some way to where he is now going to have sex with this woman that he just like for all intents and purposes just met and is basically keeping him captive or helping to. Yeah. And so I don't know, like I see that, but I also see like there's giddiness in the, uh, the idea of hurting him. Like mm -hmm. that they, it's not just that they're fulfilling their role. It's that they get to fulfill their role by killing him eventually. And he's excited by that. Not all of them are, but like the ones who keep everybody else in line, the ones who like basically call the shots on the upstairs, like they're excited about it. They've seen this play out. They're finally at the top of the heap. And that is how societies structure themselves. You know, he's yeah. now more powerful than his brothers. He's the biggest brother. He's the most, I don't know, able to command a, their attention and respect. And he is not unwilling to kill one of them if they step out of the line of the society that they've built. Like, that's how, like, all kinds of fucked up societies form and uh, organizations form is by, you know producing fear for the individuals within it so much so that they have to pursue power within the structure that they're in until they get that power. And then they feel entitled to exploit that power for themselves. So mm -hmm. I don't know, like, I think there is like sort of just by existing in this format, in this harsh situation, they are kind of pushed into being non-empathetic in order as a method of survival as a method of sure of yeah. collective survival yeah they're, they're like pruning it out of their society yeah it's not it's yeah. not really allowed there's not room for it yeah there's not room for empathy outside of the maternal home <laughs> and yeah. that is also to serve an end a mm -hmm. biological end there's an, another like kind of smaller touch that i appreciated in this movie is like they're you know they're living off grid they don't have calendars they might not even know what year it is, but the way the uh, the woman Alina seems to be marking the passage of time is yeah. when she gets her period, she like marks like the period blood on the wall. Yeah. And that is another kind of like powerful moment. Like she doesn't need a calendar. She doesn't need like her body is the clock and just like her smearing it on the wall. Mm -hmm. And then when it zooms out and you see like how many marks are on the wall, I then began to wonder like, are some of those from previous mothers or ha like, cause like, I don't think she could have possibly been there quite that long. Cause there's so many, but it's, I don't know. It's sort of something interesting to, to ponder to me. Boys, I don't know sure. about you, but I'd have a hard time getting down with a bunch of period blood. <laughs> Surrounded by <laughs> old period blood smear but, balls. Yeah. But to, to because your, of the implication. But to your point, Bob, she does reference to, uh, she references the eclipse. And I think yeah. that's why it's important to have these chapters that are dictated by the lunar calendar. Because again, yeah. that, that still does have this kind of like feminine feel of like, even like tracking periods and things like that based on like lunar is more accurate in that kind of way, I think. But, um, but and so, yeah, it does. But it, it gives it another aspect of this feminine power is everything again within her world or the way that they see things are she does have a calendar it's based on the moon and based on her period and like those kind of things and so everything 
in the science or just the understanding of this world it revolves around her again still she is the queen you know she is the focus point and even to the point at the end where she says like you had no choice yeah when he, when he tries to kind of weasel out of it that is such a kind of like not a punch in the gut but kind of like squeezing the heart even more of like you think that like you because he's like i want to be here and help you or whatever and she's like i'm in control i've yeah. always been in control they follow me or whatever it's just man that's a power that's a powerful moment um yeah that was i liked that was just like you you can't do anything and mm -hmm. then even i was wondering I don't think so because of everything else that's said throughout the movie. But at the very end, when they put the ladder down, I was wondering, do you guys think that's almost a test? Because he goes on this long thing of like, I want to stay here. I want to live with you. I want to help support it. And then she comes out begging for help. There's a problem with the baby. It's not being born. And he's tempted leave her there, run to the ladder and escape. And that's essentially what he chooses until the baby is actually born. He goes back to hold it. Mm -hmm. Do y'all think that was a test or no? I kind of felt that it was, but I don't know to what end exactly. Cause I don't think, I mean, I think if he runs, they kill him anyway. So I'm not yeah. sure what, what that alters for them, what that test means to them. But... Well, I was wondering like if he didn't actually run, cause he was, seeming like he was running until the baby was born. So like, had he just mm. stayed to support her 100% would he have gotten to live? I don't know. I just, I feel like, no. He, yeah. I, I, my, yeah. My, my reading is that I don't think he had any chance of survival. Like even if he had like immediately doted on, like it was like, that, that's the exact, that's what he offered her. And she's like, you're not in control. Like, yeah. like so I, I just don't see that being, possible it is possible but like i don't see it and i think that if he I, I, and that's what leaves me with the question of what does what does that get them to yeah. to offer that that to him but it's clear that they like that was clearly a choice they made to allow him the chance to escape at that moment so it feels like there should be a purpose to them doing that like there's a purpose to just about everything else they've done and i just don't know what it is so to that end i think that adds to like the mysteries that we don't get to know about. And I like that, but also that's one that I would desperately want to get answered more than mm -hmm. pretty much most of the other ones to the point where that one does kind of stick in my craw a little bit. I was going to bring that up as well, because that is one of the things in this movie that I'm like, what is it? What is that? What does, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, why? Why? There was one more that I wanted to ask all about that kind of, that was the one that kind of bothered me on my latest watch. I remember rem like thinking about the first ones, but now that I've seen it a few times, I was like, why, what does it do where he, the kid who was another one of the standouts, um, who's kind of like in the suit looking thing, the kid with the dark hair, the shorter, mm -hmm. dark hair. He, he's the one, man, it was chilling when he's like, Hey friend or Hey neighbor, or whatever, what mm -hmm. are you doing down there? I thought that was like a really creepy, good performance, but mm -hmm. his whole thing of what's your favorite color. And then at the very end, he's like, you should have said blue. And I was like, why, <laughs> what was that? See, what would that do? I think, I, I don't know what it would ultimately do, but I think that that speaks to the, the empathy of absence of empathy that Rob's talking about because he to me is like running the show upstairs yeah and like I think that's just a little game that they play to make it more fun to fuck with this guy if mm. I had to guess and like it, it, like these these boys they're respecting the rules they're following the rules but that doesn't mean they're not gonna like bend the rules for Indulge, their own enjoyment yeah. they are still mm -hmm. gonna do that because they're like like teenage and young adult boys that yeah have been raised in the society where it is an honor a privilege and a a, a, a rite of passage to take the life of a man who has seeded this woman that lives in the canyon. Yeah. So it, I don't know. It, I I didn't. I would be happy to like leave it at that myself, Bob. In in addition to that, like if you consider what their ultimate goal is, there's no reason for them to, you know, hit him with a pig's head and make him fall off a cliff, or you know, mm -hmm. piss on his yeah. face, or slam him into the wall, or all these like they. It's I mean, they're torturing him. Yeah, it's but there's ways to do that that like are maybe more mild than that. Just yeah. like leaving him there is an option. Yeah, I mean eventually like I don't think them doing any of that 
contributed to him having sex with Alina at all, which is what he's there to do, you know? Like, I don't know. I kind of do. Or, well, I, well, not necessarily the sex, but like I was saying, like breaking him down, mm -hmm. showing him his place, taking away his his ego or like, yeah, yeah, his agency. Because as we see, she doesn't do it until he's like hurt and defeated and kind of broken down and humiliated. That's when she finally kind of strikes and makes her move. Mm -hmm. It's like the ant after he's got his wings pulled off and like is in the depths of the thing. That's when he's made it. It's not, you know, I don't know. I, I think it was important to kind of like breaking down his agency, but that well, could just to, be my interpretation. To, I think he has to be kind of hopeless in order. For, like that's part of the game is like making him hopeless that he'll ever get out yeah. of there to the point where he's just like, fuck it. I'm going to have sex because yeah. what else am I going to do? Everything and else like, really sucks. <laughs> yeah. She's offering herself to me. This is the only good thing seemingly that has happened to me in the past nine months or whatever i mean i think the biggest the biggest thing that sort of like greases the gears on that is he drank half a fucking bottle of whiskey sure yeah, which i mean i did that to him too which I, was yeah 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 absolutely yeah but i don't think i think that contributed more to them having sex than like multiple concussions or anything else you know no but, i don't think it's the concussions i think it's the the playing with their food is both fun for them and also serves the purpose of making him see just how hopeless the situation is so that he turns to the bottle and instead of mm-hmm. trying to climb out or find devise a way out. Sure. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. That's a fair point. Yeah. Um, something that we hadn't quite touched on too much is like the, the, the setting and the importance of the setting of this movie and like how fucking beautiful it is uh, on this rewatch. Like after knowing like how the movie ends, I I feel like the canyon there's a lot of like slow panning shots of this very beautiful canyon and like some some of the textures of the rock almost look like fleshy D- did you guys like oh. get no, that vibe get that. at all I didn't yeah. get fleshy, that but no, the texture when you said texture I was like oh Bob's on my, on the same wavelength as me what yeah, I yeah. thought especially after the interview I didn't remember thinking this the first time but it it gave it this texture, like you said, and it did look more like a nest to me. Um, mm. like if you were to if you were to take like a bee's nest or a horse and like cut it in half and it's got that kind of wavy texture the way they construct it, that's what it was making me think of this time. Mm. It could just be because he said it he said it in that way, and I was like, Oh shit, yeah. But that's that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, I mean, I, what I noticed was just like the interplay of light on things and the way mm-hmm. that the shadows were, were impacting things. It just, it, it just creates because it is a very harsh environment mm-hmm. that is inhospitable. And everything in this movie is geared towards pushing him into that house where he's supposed to be. And that's mm-hmm. definitely part of it. I didn't think I just accentuates that, that and the sound design, which I also wanted to call out here. The sound design in this is fucking great. Like yeah, it's, cool. it's perfectly yeah. sparse. It has just enough like environmental noise to make you feel like you are in an isolated environment. It's not silent, but it is damn close. Um, and every little sound that echoes and reverberates like fucking crazy, it, it, they all matter in, in the grand scheme of what's happening to this man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing, one thing I want since Bob brought up the setting, one thing I that ties in with that was I made a note of what I thought was a really good choice. So I guess there's a, we do see him climb down the ladder, but the way of this setting is like, it's really cool, but it could have easily, if not handled well, could have easily not felt as intimidating because you're dealing with height and kind of depth. And I feel like a lot of the shots, it's hard to really tell just how deep in there you are, you know, just like how, but the setting up the rope scene and I don't know something about that long rope and him being like stuck in the middle with the danger of falling and then swinging back and forth that seemed to that. And then the, you know, the initial ladder was what really gave this depth to me to like really Mm. brought the fear of, fuck you're like there's no chipping away at some stones to get out like you're just nah. this is so high <laughs> yeah several so I, stories down yeah yeah i just and thought that that's, i just thought <laughs> yeah. that that scene 
worked really well to because there were some you know some still shots and like you're you're shooting from like at an angle and you kind of like see the rocks and like you know people do like even photographs and stuff with the optical illusions of mountains it's hard sometimes to capture them in that mm -hmm. way and so yeah i just i thought i wanted to give a little praise there because this time mm -hmm. i really felt like man that's given this the fear that you need out of this setting so yeah that worked well yeah yeah, yeah. the uh the setting is the I kind of took the canyon as like a womb is, is sort of like what it made me think of with like the, the fleshy kind of textures or that's how I perceive them anyways. And also something I definitely did not catch on the first go around is the road that he drives in on at the very beginning of the movie kind of resembles a sperm. I saw that the second time I watched, I was like, yeah. I do not remember that, but yeah, somebody yeah, mentioned that or like a sperm. I read that somewhere and after like, I haven't seen it since, so I can't compare, but like, yeah, I definitely missed that both times. If that's true, like, I mean, I think any windy road could no, be it's The Is second it time I saw it, I, I it looks think like a so. sperm. Yeah. It looks like a sperm. Okay. All yeah, right. Well, I have to rewatch that bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, to that end, it, I remember Barnaby was saying, if I'm not mistaken, that well, the, the palace uh, that mm, the boys live yeah. in, that we didn't get to see, that they didn't get to shoot because of like budgetary constraints. Or well, he did shoot it, but it didn't end up like he wanted it to. Is that what it was? Exactly, okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So like they ended up like altering things or whatever to, to cut that out. But like if if you are seeing this as a womb, that uh, the road where the man arrives as a sperm, and mm -hmm. he mentioned that as that cave that they're living in as being like a birth like canal. A birth canal, yeah. So mm -hmm. like that all tr makes... That all makes resonance with the concepts at play here or whatever. And I don't know. Like, I I, I think that that's, that's something that, like, in a movie that feels this grounded, I'm not looking necessarily for that kind of symbol symbolism necessarily. Like, like the visual symbolism takes me by surprise, I guess, in this one. Um, as opposed, like, well, at least when it's not, like, very blatant, like the period blood on the wall or the... Yeah the interstitials with the plate or whatever those those bits are like oh that's just clearly like but like anything that's kind of like hidden like that i just wasn't really like looking for in the same way so it's interesting to know that there's like a, a little bit of extra if you go digging mm. well it's yeah. interesting too because one one thought that i had too especially like um, second or third watch was because of the drawings on the wall then i was getting this like snake pit idea which is one of the things i don't i it doesn't necessarily bother me that that's i i am curious like, why is it a snake because mm -hmm. especially after the interview all the other visuals that i was getting a lot of the time like there's this um pretty cool shot where the boys the sun's going down it's pretty dark so it's like they're dark silhouettes and they're marching on the hill and they kind of look like ants you know marching and you have this queen and these um soldiers bringing her things and providing for her and so everything else seems to kind of point to this like insects um you know with the queen at the top and i was just like what's up with the snake what like what is the snake with the shedding of the skin and I don't know. I was just so curious about it. I mean, if you want to get, I, I, I think that you could write that off to be like just another of many symbols in this movie that are just geared towards um, natural processes and the passage of time, you know, like just, you know, the shedding of skin, the renewal, yeah. all that sort of thing. It could be as basic as that. I, I like, I wasn't necessarily thinking about it in terms of insects either of those, but like that, that does make more, like more of a, it makes more of a sense in terms of like, I don't know how snakes live necessarily. So I guess I could be talking about it out of my ass, but like a colony of ants is a very clear one, like, like metaphor that you can put onto this movie and, yeah. or like a hive of bees or whatever else with one central, like, like matriarchal leadership. I don't think snakes live that way. <laughs> I don't think so. Nah, nah, nah. You know, but not in a some colony of that snakes that makes some kind of sense. There's like no animologist over here. <laughs> Animologist. <laughs> the snake thing, the I took English, it. Doc, we ain't scientists. The, there's probably a very specific thing that we just don't know about. But the way I took it was like, a, you know, a sort of more of like a, you know, they're, they're a snake in the grass, sort of like a a, a mm. hidden or un, unforeseen sort of threat in mm -hmm. that she very much is because she's she's very like 
quiet, keeps to herself, like unassuming at the, the beginning of the movie. But it turns out like she's pulling the strings. She's the boss. Like you yeah. just don't know it yet. However, um, that's I'm how sorry, I took continue. it. Continue. Yeah. It, However, like to that end, I kind of had this thought as we were talking, like I was saying how like if you break step, step out of line in the society, then the boys up top can kill you. And that that makes kind of sense. Mm -hmm. But I forgot. Honestly, I was thinking about this. I forgot that the that she specifically takes issue with that and screams at them about it. Mm -hmm. So like maybe her powers have a limit. Uh, certainly with them, it seems like they have a limit. And yeah. so I don't know, like, I, I don't know what that says exactly. I'm just kind of like circling yeah. it right in a second. Well, yeah, I mean, I... yeah, I was thinking about the aspect of what if this dude flipped on her and threatened her, then the whole, right. they, they're kind of throwing him in yeah. with the queen. And if he doesn't play it, you know, like they want then well that's why because he goes through he finds it a pickaxe or whatever mm -hmm. and and maybe she has more power than we realize showing the snake because there is the moment which i thought was another really cool scene where she does get mad at the boys and she's got this like double voice mm -hmm. calling out this layered voice and that was really cool to kind of show maybe something else is going on but ultimately she hits him with a piece of wood so I'm like, what happens if this dude takes this pickaxe and says, let me the fuck out of here, or she's getting an axe to the throat? Yeah. What are they going to do? See, that's the thing, is I think that she, like that's part of the problem. That's why it's so important for them not to let on that she is part, that they're related in some way. Other, yeah. like, mm -hmm. It's important for her to seem as terrorized as he feels by yeah. them. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is yeah, that's fair. To be the yeah. in group and the kids need to be the out group. Yeah, that is terrorizing them. If that doesn't happen, then he has leverage. He has a ransom, basically. Yeah, he can hold. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's fair. I th yeah, she, I think she gets so mad at the end because like that is, I assume, one of her children that that has been killed. Sure. Oh yeah. yeah. And yeah. there's also a, a very brief moment where one of the kids up top. He he doesn't have a shirt on and he turns around and you see he's got the same large birthmark on his back that his mother has. Yeah. So like oh, I didn't even catch that. Mm -hmm, I, I which I don't I don't think birthmarks are hereditary necessarily, but like you know, they're they're related, obviously. Like he is her son, and probably several of them are, I would think. But well, I, I was uh, curious about that because it does look like a birthmark, but the wound on the kid that's hanging. Mm-hmm also looked to be in a similar shape and i was like did, did they yeah. remove his skin to say like you're not a part of the family anymore or was that Could be, a, yeah. is that like yeah. some kind of Fucked branding up. wound that's or something i don't know I, I but i did notice the shape and i was like oh yeah. that's that's interesting maybe i'm assuming it's a birthmark maybe it is more of a brand yeah that could, could be. be yeah i don't know it's a scarlet letter maybe i i that would be fucking nuts i kind of wish that if that were true we could have seen it a little more with a little more fidelity yeah. so that we could be I, so that I could have been in on that. I mean, like, Oh, what's, what's this carving that they've done? But mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Again, that like that ambiguity is there to keep like, to keep the mystery alive, even though we know from the beginning, the like what, what ultimately will happen is that somebody's like this woman who's, Oh, he's, he's getting, he's in this hole with this woman and he's not able to leave. The movie's called The Seeding. Oh, like it doesn't take very much to put that together. Mm -hmm. What's that somebody's going to get impregnated? Mm -hmm. But like the circumstances around that, like this is why I like kind of took issue with like the the mystery comments that I saw or whatever. Like, oh, this the mystery is all all resolved right away or whatever. It's like, I mean, have you never watched a historical <laughs> film or anything? Like, <laughs> like I I kind of feel like any World War II movie that ends <laughs> with D Day or like ends with like yeah, or that's what fair. is it V A Day or whatever like. You know, you know how that's going to end. Day. <laughs> what is V8 what is day. <laughs> v V8 day. Free tomato uh, juice for everyone. Fuck, I can't remember the names of the days now. I'm We're making my, but, <laughs> like anything that's just, like depicting history. You know how that ends too. It's yeah, not, sure, but it's not sure. the history itself. It's the circumstances that you watch play out. Now yeah. that's fair because I was about to play devil's advocate. It's not something that bothered me, but just to kind of like give a perspective. Also, like, well, I'll get into that later. But so. I could see the only thing that I would say as a pairing for this, I think it's cool, but the poster could, the poster with the title, the seating plus the poster that we get is really cool design, but could be very spoilery because I mean, the whole idea is like this, I, this guy is going to end up dead and the whole like poster is him in the ground 
yeah. as a skeleton with the flower coming out. But now you kind of just... It is really badass, though. It is but really yeah. badass. Yeah. But, ra- but also, so I was just going to use that to play devil's advocate. It's not how I feel. But then Randy kind of just like shut on that. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Thanks. Like, I just think, I, I think that's like... Uh, that's the premise of the movie to me. That's not the mystery of the movie. It's the premise yeah, that, like, that's fair. even yeah. from the outset of the word, the seeding, like, unless you're going in full blind and you need to figure it out as you go, like, just having seen that poster or whatever, you don't necessarily know that's him. You don't know the circumstances of that. You don't know if there's actually that, if there's flowers involved in this story. We don't know any of that. Yeah. You know, so, like, it's an, like, every movie poster that's effective, or most of them, it's just a, a way of poetically showing the themes of the film or uh, um, something from the film, in this case, the themes in, in, in some poetic fashion, that's really all it is. And that's fine with me. It doesn't, again, like it doesn't spoil it for me to know that she's trying to seduce him. I knew that pretty early in the movie pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, like, it didn't, I, I still got to watch the journey and got to sort of piece together the, the why, like how these pieces interlock and all that stuff. And that's, what's interesting to me is really diving into the the nitty gritty of the microcosms as much as we're allowed. And then being left with questions of how they like at the end that still don't like, you still don't get to know exactly how they interlock. We, uh, we need to land that plane. Actually we're <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a runaway runaway train there, boys. Uh, if a you guys have to discuss, yeah, there is. Yeah, there is a lot here. There's a lot to unpack. Um, if you guys do have anything else you want to mention, of course, feel free. Out of five, uh, Randy, you were kind of winding winding into your final thoughts, anyways. Why don't you just sure. continue on? Uh, how do you feel? Uh, out of five. Um. Yeah. No. I I feel pretty good about this. I we 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 kind of were pretty glowing with this movie overall. I think like I I told Barnaby outright in our interview that I was going to be a biased party because he's a lovely guy. Um. But and that's all true. But uh, in an effort to sort of like be at least moderately objective. Some of the things that sort of like stuck stuck in my craw a little bit were what I mentioned before, like not really knowing necessarily a few things that I kind of wish that I had known or not focusing in on a couple of things that would have clued me in if, of the sim- symbolism that, that I missed or that, I don't know. It could be that I'm just dense. That seems very likely, actually. But I don't know. I, I feel like um, I got a lot out of this movie even without those things. And that to me feels like, famously the thing that I like most about these kinds of movies, which is it gives me more to chew on. It gives me more to think about. We've talked about this for a while and we could probably keep talking about it for another hour. And we talked about it with Barnaby. So, and we talked about it privately. So that's what I like in a, in a, a kind of thinky horror movie, um, a movie that's built on tension and all those things. So like, I, I don't know, I, I'm of two minds about even my, my complaints about this movie. I think um, we could have done with a little bit more of the boys, even if it is from a distance still. I think that is effective, but I kind of wish that I'd seen like a little more of how they interact with each other because we only got like kind of little hints of that, I feel like. Um, I don't know. I think that the performances were mostly good. Um, I don't have really anybody to point out that or anything to point out that felt like hollow or, or out of place. I think that the like maybe um, dream sequence what, that was maybe a little on the overly ambiguous side for me because I kind of like I didn't notice like the fucking necklace of penises. Jesus Christ, I didn't notice that. <laughs> um, that would have to me alleviated one of my other problems that I had, or one of the things that kind of stuck out to me is like this movie starts and opens with an infant eating a finger, and that is like the most gruesome thing that happens in the whole movie, pretty much. I, I kind of felt like a little bit shortchanged in terms of gore, and I'm not a gore hound really. So like I kind of want there is some gore in this there is some like brutal shit that happens but like that is by far that and like stringing up uh, I can't remember this fucking kid's name Lapis Lapis that those are like the two like fucking brutal moments like brutal things that are in this movie are like visually brutal things and I just feel like there could have been just a little bit more of that um, I understand that there's kind of a push and pull because you need it to be you don't want this to turn into the outwaters. You know what I mean? You want this to still be like something <laughs> where this guy that. can let his guard down and then be used in the way that he's being intended to be used. But still, I was like, the, each opening with that shot to me signals a gorier movie than we ultimately got. And that was a little bit of a drag for me. Um, with those things out of the way, I don't have a lot of other complaints that I can think of. And I would really just kind of be 
I would kind of be, you know, book reporting it here if I tried to. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a four out of five. Um, I want to give this a little bit more time to grow in my brain and like think about other movies that it compares to. Um, I've heard, you know, uh, I've heard like much, like much more dire responses to this movie than that, but I really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it more than once. That's like, it's beautiful to look at. It's beautiful to listen to. It's fucked up and it's got enough to chew on conceptually for me that it doesn't feel shallow at all. And I don't have a big problem with the idea of the mystery being on its being the premise instead of like, like we talked about earlier, basically. So to me, it's a four out of five. Right on. Solid four out of five from Ray and Deasy. Juice, what about you? Yeah, I would say that the seating does a really good job of planting fear in the barren soil of the mind. Oh Here my we go. God. <laughs> wow. That's on the back the of the barren box. soil of the mind. <laughs> straight chilling podcast. It is not in the file. So do straight chilling podcast. Um, uh, <laughs> so, so but. You want to be credited that way? I I don't want to be credited as Randu. I'll tell you that. Randeezy. Oh, yeah. How about Randeezy, Rand? Would that be okay? (laughs) Um, But no, yeah, I I really enjoyed this film. Um, Even, you know, it's so I do like like Randy said, I do want to be objective in in some ways, but also to 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 mention a couple things that I didn't as far as praises. I mentioned this. I generally don't like desert films most of the yeah. time just because it's not like I don't know something about the texture and the setting and the heat and stuff like that just feels and looks very unpleasant most of the time. So. I was very impressed with that and aware, even the first time I watched it, what that I was like, wow, this setting looks beautiful. It's utilized in a very interesting way and it's not bothering me. And it's even like intriguing and working really well um, as a positive for me, which was very surprising and shocking because that's not typically how it goes. Um, some of the notes that I took. Um, the ending scene we didn't really talk about. I thought that that was just super effective. Just he's not even buried or or anything. He's just there. Um, he's just left there, and his skeleton is like rotting and everything. So, um, that was that was effective. Um, what else? Um, oh, there's just some baller quotes. She she drops some awesome lines. Um, in the desert, nothing is wasted. Right before he's yeah, man, you know, that's a good his, one. Yeah, another one. She's just tearing him down. This dude, he just gets torn down, and like it works so well though. But he, she says, um, "Seeds blow in with the wind." Like, like yeah, like, uh, which is another cool tie into nature. Um, again, you you never had any choice. Um, the dream sequence, kind of touching on maybe what I would have liked to see a little bit more from this is. The dream sequence worked really well for me because it was this kind of like psychological horror of this, this seeming son, you know, suckling at his mother's milky teat when, and I didn't even see the necklace of dicks, which is crazy. So um, another thing that was kind of different about that scene too, (laughs) is you had a lot more of the kids there. There are some, some of the smaller ones, maybe the one we see at the beginning. Um, And and I kind of wish that we had kind of like what Randy said. I, I wish we had gotten a couple more scenes, not a lot of the kids. If he could have been able to pull off that shot of where they stay and how disgusting and primal it is, I feel like mm-hmm. that would have been really great and effective. I completely understand based on limitations and budgets and stuff. There's only so much you can do. And I respect cutting something that doesn't look great because there was another scene actually, to be fair um, and objective, like Randy, there was one scene with the kids that I felt wasn't up to par with like kind of the rest of the movie. And it was one where he does a zoom in of their face and they're kind of doing their chant, which I thought the chant and again, the sound design and everything like that worked really well. But it had like the flames over their face. Um, This kind of like, I don't know. That was the only one where I was like, ah, they kind of work better at a distance to me when I'm like not right in their face and the flames didn't really do much for me. But then he followed it up with the dream sequence or possible dream, whatever of. Um, that worked really well. So I was like, ah, I wish we could have maybe got a couple more of those and really maybe push that um, better. But um, but yeah, that, that was the only scene that stood out to me where I was like, ah, oh, that's the only one that 
doesn't seem up to par, I guess. Um, there's some smaller things too. I don't know if they're intentional or not, but like something about the way she eats really bothers me. I don't, there's something about it that seems unsettling um, that just doesn't sit well. I like the idea of them calling in a palace. And even though he couldn't shoot, they're kind of teasing that. Um, I thought that that was pretty effective. Um, oh, also too, the way the kids dress and he kind of mentioned this, there's aspects of this film where I just said, this is a kind of movie where I love thinking about the process, somebody going out and picking those clothes and trying them on these kids. And like I said, the one that was most effective to me was the kid up on the hill where he's got these chains on and this like tattered suit. And he just looks really, I don't know. Uh, I don't he, that, that one to me, that kid specifically, his just like outline and, the clothes he was wearing in his performance kind of like really stood out to me. Um, I was wondering like, uh, just not to interrupt, but like, I was wondering if there was some direct like Peter Pan and the Lost Boys inversion happening here. Yeah, I, I think I got I think. the silhouette oh, yeah. of those kids, like the kid with the top hat, like that's yeah. Yeah. so yeah. distinctly uh, Peter Pan to me. But like, obviously the, 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 actually in that book, I mean, Wendy who goes to Neverland does kind of become the center of the Lost Boys universe yeah. for the time that she's there. She does, but she's not oh. necessarily in... They don't respect her as much as I right. think they it's respect not, this. She, yeah. They treat does her like a mother, also, though. She does wear a, a dickless, though, famously. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> Dick. She, yeah, she yeah. does. Oh, this is a lovely. But they, yeah, but you're right. They do refer to her as mother. We need a mother, and they get. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good call for sure. Um. And uh, and maybe like not necessarily a negative for me, but it was just a thought that I had was what I brought up earlier is um, the boys. I, I wrote the boys play by the rules. They respect the woman and they work to serve her. What happens if he threatens her well-being? Um, and maybe she's more powerful than we see. You know, She gets that double voice. We have these paintings on the wall. We don't know. I like the teases of like the first mother and you don't know how long this is going on and this second language and this chant that they do. It's all very intriguing and very interesting. Um, I'm going to echo Randy and say I'm going to give this a four as well, which I think was my initial score that I gave like right after Buffon was done. So I kind of want to stick with that, even though I agree with Randy. It's it's as much shit as I give old, what's his name, Chris Stuckman or whatever. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> tough when you're like interviewing people and you already like it anyways, but yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think four is, four is fair. It's not easy, yeah. Yeah. I, I also want like, oh man. There was something you said. Uh, no, I lost it. I might come back to it later. Sorry. Okay. Bob, right in the middle of Bob's review. Make oh, hey. sure you tell yeah. us right I'm going to do that. Bob's review. Just please. plow right yeah, yeah, Shut up for a second, Bob. I got this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Bob, one more oh, thing. I know though, what it was. I, I thought the thrills that blossom here, <laughs> they really blossom yeah. into sheer terror. <laughs> oh. You know, yeah. you know, so. I'm tired of this, Grandpa. That's too damn bad. <laughs> Some people might say the seating uh, drags you into the deep end of your worst nightmares and holds you beneath the surface for 100 minutes. <laughs> Some might yes. say that. Some might print that on a box. I don't know. Some so, might. This uh, um, this movie, we, we, we definitely praise this movie at length. There's a couple little things that did bother me. I don't think we touched on um, the when they actually do have uh, the sex scene. The way it's shot is a little like odd it, it's sort hmm. of like blurry and like um it's got almost like a like a some sort of like time delayed filter on the movement i so thought the it, slow motion seemed kind of weird that's right yeah, yeah I, I thought that was yeah. indicative yeah. of his mental yeah. state like every yeah and that, yeah. that's fair and that is fair yeah it's i didn't love how it looked but that is fair mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was chosen uh with with a purpose such as that um also towards towards the end when the woman um, gets really upset and she starts yelling at the other kids and she gets that sort of like double voice happening. It sounds cool. Maybe it's my ears, but like I couldn't understand the vast majority of what she was saying. You lame brains. I thought she was speaking in the second language, at least part of the time. Maybe. I think it was like maybe a that's multiple case, language yeah. situation, mm, okay. like a, a hybrid Man. language. I wanted to get more. I, it felt like a really important moment to me. And I was like, fuck, like, I can't, I can't parse out exactly what she's saying. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I wanted, I yeah. wanted to. <laughs> I kind of so, like, I feel like that might've been something that was expounded in the, the palace with the boys where they're yeah. having, because like 
that's like a fucking clockwork orange thing man where it's just like yeah dude yeah. the droogies have their own way of talking and you don't necessarily know what they're saying but you have to piece it together with the bits of language you figure it know. out yeah, yeah. I, I, this is totally a cannibal movie, but like I, I wanted more cannibalism. I, I definitely did. Um, even when we were uh, interviewing Barnaby Clay, we talked a little bit about Texas Chainsaw and how that was somewhat of an inspiration, which, um, yeah, I just wanted a little bit more of that. But those are really like my only complaints. Uh, the vast majority of, of, I think, what Barnaby was trying to do, I think he did very successfully. Um, the performances are solid. Something something that we didn't really get into. Um, I really fucking liked the title card and also like the interstitial like chapter cards that come mm-hmm. in. They look like really badass. Um, they, I think they do a good job at like setting the tone of what's to come after. Um they look yeah. like really badass. They look uh, like really back of the badass. box quote. <laughs> Put it on there. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think all the other positives we we have harped on, honestly. So I won't repeat them. Um, I'm gonna come in just a touch below y'all with a three point five out of five on the seating. That's gonna put our aggregate at a three point eight. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into our Rotten Tomatoes segment. And see what the critics real quick, Bob. <laughs> oh my God! See what the critics and users have to say about the seating. All right. But before we continue on, the one other thing I was going to say as a negative is, <laughs> is that uh, fuck Bob. I, I'm actually a little surprised that Juice mm-hmm. uh, didn't bring this up because this seems like very much his axe that he always grinds, which is that I felt like Wyndham as a character definitely made some real boneheaded decisions and was slow on the uptake. That's and fair. Was not that, making yeah. decisions I personally would have made. And the, normally that's yeah. a ding for you, and it can be for me as well. And so it kind of is a little the bit. The only one time I consider, I I kind of just consider him as just a character. If the only one time I thought that it was pushing its luck a little bit was when he digs up a ring and some yeah, keys. The keys. And doesn't really show too much concern about it. That was it. He, he's yeah. also like strikes me that's as just like m- maybe not the sharpest tool. I, yeah, that's I, I, I a lot of the things that he did, I was kind of like, I feel like he he feels kind of like uh like a little spoiled or something. I don't know. He just feels yeah, like he, yeah, he's yeah. not considering these things often. He's not looking he's for danger. He's not. I, yeah, I just I don't know. I So that was the only time that it kind of struck me. Otherwise, I just chalked it up to him yeah. as a character. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, hey. Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> this is the Rotten Tomatoes segment, ladies and gentlemen, in which I'm going to have these gentlemen guess within the best of their abilities what the aggregate positive uh, scores are for the seeding in both the critics and users category on RottenTomatoes.com. Um, we're going to start, as we always do, with the critical reviews. There are only 28. Very fresh movie. Kind of low profile, I guess. I'm a little surprised because of its festival run, but yeah. 28 reviews. to. Well, here. if we were approved on Rotten Tomatoes, we'd be on mm-hmm. there, you know? We are one five-star review away on Barnaby. Barnaby. If you're listening, go on <laughs> iTunes, give us a five star so we can put You scratch our, our squ- back, we <laughs> scratch yours. It's a real good situation for everybody. The funny thing about um, my back is it's continue. <laughs> Are you super batting on this I was. podcast right I was. now? God damn. Have you heard of our podcast? So um <laughs> we're gonna start with Bob uh tonight. Uh out of those 28 critic reviews, what do you think the aggregate positive score or aggregate of positive scores would be out of a hundred percent zero to a hundred out of 100 percent um i'll do pretty much what we what we rated it 75 75 percent juice how about you hmm yeah that's a good guess um i maybe i'll just go a scotch higher toward my personal score and give it an 80 all right, an 80 from Juice and a 75 from Bob. Now, gentlemen, uh, I want you to reflect in the mirror uh, and then reflect on the Chris Stuckman website, YouTube <laughs> channel, as I read to you. The aggregate score, the aggregate of positive scores is 57%. Oh, Bob is going to take this one. Oh, no. Criminally low, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a little low. <laughs> what? A little low. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty low. <laughs> What the fuck? That's an extremely low amount of reviews, and I'm gonna just chalk it up to that. But mm. there's some pretty like, there's some yeah. higher profile reviewers in in the mix here, like as as they come. 
We and, did um, read one that was a, what was it? Bloody yeah. disgusting or something. And disgusting. we just like completely here. dis like, or, yeah. uh, did not agree with the entire review. Yeah. <laughs> just really like dissed it. The diss tracks coming out tomorrow. Fuck um, you. Bloody disgusting. I mean, <laughs> oh, that's, that's a lot. Opinions are what they are. You know, yeah, yeah, it, that's, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah just, we got to yeah, play I the just... game now, boys. We're about to be in the big show. <laughs> RottenTomatoes.com. Well, yeah. well, it's the big show. After they've famously been like uh, outed for people just paying for reviews. and shit, Right. We're yeah. Finally yeah. It's our turn to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> hey, me. Soju. Um, and I'll say things like this. The desert hides more than <laughs> Sand and sun in uh, the seating. Uh, in the there seating. We go. So yeah, Bob's gonna take that one by a margin of oh god, what is it like? Um, almost twenty. Yeah. Whoa. Oof. Almost twenty percentage points off. So goddamn. Now let's move over to the. Well, actually, I'm sorry. There is no uh, no aggregate a- audience score because there are fewer than fifty ratings on the audience oh, okay. rating, which makes sense, I guess, because it's a fairly new movie and again, kind of low profile yeah. in the overall yeah. scheme of things. So that's unfortunate. Um, there's no critic consensus either. Still too low. So I guess we're just going to jump to the negative reviews yeah. and see if any of them are funny. Spoiler alert. I've already dug through these and most of them are just like annoying to me. Oh. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so here's one. Clay's surreal drama isn't stillborn as much as it's emotionally uninflected and monotonous. I, I Can you hear the farts? Can you hear the fart sounds I echoing through the speaker as I say that? Yeah. <laughs> now the only i was thinking now okay so to be fair um ty west i love um in the Hou- uh, house of the house devil of the or devil. whatever yeah, devil, yeah. and that was one that was popping up to me because i've always been like i really like house of the devil and then there's a lot of people like oh i fucking hate house of the devil so you know i was like okay i could see people because it's it's got a, a slower pace i guess but as someone well, that that, that from... doesn't bother it doesn't bother me at all so that has an 85 percent on rats you know, well, so yeah. and th- four times the reviews counted it's certified yeah. fresh and i don't know man like i i that's from the critics too i would expect that maybe from the from the um users because yeah. users are a little bit more hot and cold they're yeah, not that's always fair, necessarily yeah. media literate at all um but from the critics i expected a little more than this honestly like some of these reviews, and that here's the thing though, it does show it's like some of these people give like a numerical score, and it does show some of that. And even the negative reviews are kind of like a lot of them are kind of like down the middle, so more than they yeah. are outright negative. So yeah, I, I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah, I got take it. that for I see what, what you're worth. saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rotten um, Tomatoes largely doesn't fucking matter anyways. But yeah, no, it doesn't. I guess that's why we're so desperate it. to be on it. Well, I guess even <laughs> if you gave it a three out of five, like if a bunch of people gave yeah. it a three out of five. A few and days. then, like, there was two or three that gave it a, a two and a half or two, then that would drop it. Yeah. To yeah. That I mean, there's a couple of 1.5s yeah. out of four. There's some twos out of five. Those are a lot of them don't have a numerical score, though. So we just won't sure. know. The, we can't. It makes you anything. wonder, like, have these people seen a bad movie? Do they know how bad movies I know. Well, can be? yeah. <laughs> Man, I know. Do especially. You know? Especially even, I mean, I don't know. When I first saw this, I didn't even necessarily think like independent movie or anything yeah, like well, that. Yeah, well, we didn't know anything about it. I didn't it know anything all. about it. I was yeah. just really impressed by it. Well, yeah. um, and not only that, honestly, one of our friends over at, um, oh, from Overlook, uh, what's. Uh, Scariest thing? Ted Gagan? Yeah. It's, you know, scariest things. Oh, um, okay. They had he was at the um, he was at Beef on Two, and he sent me an email, and he was like, "Hey man, are you at the festival?" And I was like, "Yeah," and he's like, "Oh, did you see the seating?" I was like, "Yeah, I did." And he thought it was awesome too. Um, hmm. He like independently, know. he just like happened to send me a text, and I was like, "Yeah, it was awesome." So I don't know. I feel like this is a movie that that's uh, that's just kind of like primed for a little bit of um. A slow build into having its people. You know what I mean? Could be. Could be. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. I would say, like, beware the seeds of cruelty sown in the desert sands (laughs) of the seeding. (laughs) Oh, no, not again. That's what you'd say, huh? Yeah. And that's what I'd say personally. Dude, told you from Straight Shot. If you get a quote on the box, and I buy it. I'm. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna cross right. We should have. Like, I, I really hope it? that we all I'll get quotes on the box. It, yeah. We're the only three quotes. Please. Please. It's all dependent it. on our. But it's all gotta part. say Bob, Soju, and Randy Easy though. That's what it's gonna say. Uh, man, 
just, it's that's how the game is played. Uh, <laughs> just nonsense. <laughs> just nonsense. Okay. Every oh, you know what? From now, that's my goal for 2024. I'm getting on a box. Like every a box new quote. every new movie we cover, that's that's my goal. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> even the the Ghostbusters on Ice movie, yep, you're gonna, even you're gonna go for that. <laughs> yeah, a rip roaring good time. <laughs> this pre rise on Ice. A, so please. is the original cast. But Chat <laughs> GPT, all of your box responses though, like do not think of them yourself. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> Make them as base as possible. I do have some yeah. integrity. Wait, <laughs> but not much. It depends. Spider Man <laughs> is swinging into theaters. Um. Yeah, that's it for the Rotten Tomatoes segment. Let's move the fuck Barnaby on. Clay is swinging into theaters. <laughs> the seating uh, is blooming in the theaters. <laughs> that's my favorite <laughs> fucking movie review trope. Like, my buddies over on a different Discord, they, they've they been making those jokes and pointing out where uh, authors do that for, like, five years. <laughs> Just, like, collecting a dot, like... Every fucking movie. Is, Indiana Jones is swinging into theaters. And it's not just swinging. It's anything. It's great. <laughs> the seating... The seating has yielded one bountiful harvest. <laughs> the seating sure. is jizzing into theaters <laughs> this weekend. That's going on the box for sure. That's in the box. <laughs> uh, uh, hope you uh, got that dry cleaner on speed dial because this yeah. movie is messy. Uh, Randy, is that it? That's or it. Rot- Rotten Tomatoes? Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and jump into a little bit of trivia. It's totally time. Trivia. All right, boys, this is, you know, obviously a brand new movie. There really wasn't any trivia that I could find for it. Um, however, Barnaby obviously does uh, like offer up some pretty interesting tidbits during our interview. Definitely check that out. We dropped that last week. Um, I did look up the meanings of all the different phases of the moons that were used in the interstitial title cards throughout mm. the course of the movie because I didn't know what the fuck they meant. Um, so I do have that that we can run through for some trivia. So the first one uh, that pops up says Sturgeon Moon. And that is the August full moon, which is traditionally known as the Sturgeon Moon because of the abundance of that type of fish in the Great Lakes in August. Apparently, um, apparently that was like coined hundreds of years ago. So I don't know if the sturgeon fish are still in abundance, but or we just killed them all. They, we, <laughs> they were probably mean, overfished. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and assume they're not. <laughs> yeah. the they're gone. Point. They're extinct. <laughs> yeah. We ate them all. That's it. Um, the next one up is the harvest moon, which I feel like everybody's heard, heard of. The oh harvest yeah. Moon. Neil Young's great. <laughs> Uh, it's it's the full moon that happens closest to the autumnal equinox, uh, which is you know the start of fall. And for several nights in a row, a large full moon rises shortly after sunset. Long before electricity, farmers would take advantage of the bright moonlight when it was time to harvest their crops. Thus, the name of the harvest moon. Huh. All right, um, the gold moon. This one is, is another one I'd never heard of before. I was one. I wrote a note that said, "Did that say cold moon or gold moon?" Because of the font. Yeah, it's that <laughs> that script is kind of a little tough. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. It, it it says gold, and when I when I pulled this up, I kept coming across yellow moon, but not much gold moon. I couldn't really find a whole lot about this, other than it's just um, something that symbolizes generally an abundance um, of crops and just general prosperity. Like I couldn't, I couldn't um, really find a whole lot of, you sure are you hundred percent sure moon? it's not cold moon? Cause yeah, there's cause a solution no. for that. Oh, it's well, fucking a, what is that? I, okay. I, I thought so it I, said yeah. gold. Okay. On time and date.com, the authority on these matters. Um, it says cold moon is December's full moon and yeah, December when winter to. sets in the Northern hemisphere, the full moon is called the cold moon. It's nice. a, yeah, it's the first full moon after the winter solstice when temperatures are normally freezing in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> that font fucked me up then. Good yeah. save, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking forward to that gold moon, though. That gold <laughs> moon. That. It's gold from all the cheese, as we know. Uh, the blue moon is the next one, which is, again, something I'm sure we've all heard of. Uh, so the blue moon is... Um, the uh the moon technically takes 29 and a half days to complete its full cycle which means just 354 days to complete the full 12 lunar cycle so every two and a half years there is a bonus 13th full moon which is ob- observed in one calendar year and that 13th full moon um is the blue moon 
Cool. That's it. All right. I didn't really know why we call it a blue moon, so that's cool. It's a bonus moon. And then finally, the last one is the beaver moon, uh, which is November's full moon. I can moon. smell a beaver from 30 miles away. Yeah, no, November's full moon. It arises uh, from the fact that these animals have gathered sufficient food stores and begun to take shelter in their lodges at this time of year. Mm, so like hi- like hibernation I, moon yeah, kind yeah. of deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Interesting. There you go. There you go. There you I go feel there. more in tune with nature now. We are one with nature here at Straight Chilling. (laughs) On our Zoom call. (laughs) Yes. In my basement. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But yeah, that's that's pretty much all I got for trivia. Let's jump into our Cooter of the Week. Straight Chilling. Cooter of the Week. Juice, what is a cooter and why do we hunt them? Oh, cooter is a character type and a straight chillin' exclus. Cooter must hit three of these five points to be considered a cooter, but we want the cooter with the most points. The five points of cooterdom are sexual deviancy, manipulation, smug arrogance, overall looking attire, and overall patheticness. Boys, do you think that there is a cooter in the seating? Yes. I think there's an argument to be made. Um, Bob, where were you going to go with it? Were you going to go collective or are you going to go individual? I was going to go collective, like the whole clan, oh. I think. I think you, I think there's a case to be made for individual. Sure. But okay. collective is okay. But um, So I was just looking this up. Uh, some of these people are assigned names, even though I don't think they're spoken. Uh, maybe they are, and it's just hard to understand. But um. So the one boy who's got the long hair who ends up killing our main Mm -hmm. character, he is labeled as Arvo, A-R-V-O. And I I think he probably hits enough on his own to be labeled. So what I would say is um, sexual deviancy, one, because he is the one who pees on the guy. And also he does the weird thing with the brother where he's talking about like his skin being soft and cold and stroking yeah, it. I forgot about weird. that. Mm-hmm. So sexual deviancy, check. Smug arrogance, because the whole time he's the one who's like, I'm going to get you when the time comes. And um, I don't know, just kind of like throwing out lines like that. He's definitely got some smug arrogance. Um, manipulation. Now this is harder because this is more of like a collective thing. They're all fucking with him and i don't know if you necessarily see this individual play a part in it but he's a part of it so i mean i would say manipulation probably for him so that he I think gets they all three. get that yeah, yeah th- i think sure. so yeah he gets three you could say look in attire because all of their clothes are wonky and just mismatched and crazy so that would probably hit um but not really patheticness i guess because he's pretty much like in control of everything so so four yeah I mean, yeah. yeah, I think that a lot of that can be applied collectively, though. And that's the thing is, like, yeah. if you're going to go individual, I think there's a case to be made for, and I cannot remember her fucking name. Alina. Alina, yeah. Alina because, like, the manipulation is off the charts there. Like, she's very, very much, like, keeping mum her re- true purpose and all that. Sexual deviance. <laughs> oh, Pop, I thought, I thought there was a problem with the recording. No, <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sexual deviance. Yes, yes. Um, using somebody for their seed is generally frowned upon. What? Hunting for day. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the clean bump. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, so sexual deviancy, manipulation, smug arrogance. I don't know if we really see that. She's. It's almost like more dutiful in her case. Yeah. Um, looking attire, not really. Patheticness, again, not really. So, okay, yeah. So that definitely hits lower on the scale, having gamed it out there. I think we yeah, put I them think, all together, though. I think we can put them all together because they all have this the same goal in mind, and they, they all, I think, hit at least three. I mean, you know. they all come pretty close and like yeah it's the, like just manipulation alone like that's it, uh, that all of this is set up to operate in this such a way to entrap people and impregnate this woman to keep the yeah. society going like that that's a high level of coordination also for manipulation for a bunch of kids i guess i don't know exactly where to lump this in but like they're cannibals that's got to land somewhere. <laughs> like, I don't know. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I don't know where. Don't know what... Pathetic. Uh, patheticness, maybe. <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I don't know. 
Oh, um, yeah. It's very interesting because I was looking, they all have individual names and I'm sure that they have some, some special meaning. So Corvus, mm-hmm. Orion, Arvo, Vela. Like, I feel like those gotta be some kind I'm of sure. special yeah. meaning. So that's pretty cool though. I will say as just like kind of a, a fun little thing, just, I was looking up at IMDB to see, get all their names and they all together went to Tribeca and like are taking pictures, you know, in front mm-hmm. of them. And it just like looks, they, they look close. It just looks like fun. So, well, yeah, like Barnaby was saying, they kind of formed their own little group just yeah. in the filming of this movie, which is yeah. nice. And now they live know, in the desert love... and they eat people. Yeah. You got to love a, uh, a shoot that, that leaves people friends at the end. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not always the case. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that kind of lends itself to like low budget filmmaking. Like it, it's a labor mm-hmm. of love. Everybody comes together and like, you know, they, 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 they share the same vision and yeah. like put in a little extra effort. Cause it's a labor of in love. In the best and... cases. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, I mean, that's true. Not not in every case, but yeah, yeah. I, I think we, I think we got them. All we of got them, boys. So. <laughs> Round them, like, lock them up. Yeah, put them in a dog kennel. We got them. God the damn. seating is full of cooters. <laughs> so you straight chilling podcast. <laughs> that's that's a great box quote. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna move some units. For I know. You, I, think right so. I think so. I think that's the one you want. Scooter the sales have shot up 35% since we put that quote on there. People love a cooter filled movie. The, the seeds reviews are very angry that there's no pornography in this, but whatever. Now with 69% more cooter. Well, so the, he could have got the half star for the Yabos, but we got the dong swinging. So I had to, you know, had to cut back. Dude, there, so. yeah. The dismembered dong swinging, apparently. And no. yeah, and like eight dismembered dongs. Which I didn't <laughs> see, to be fair, but yeah. We got- we got not just a dong, but a, a pissing dong. I'm legit going to go yeah. back and get a screenshot for Randy with the sperm road. And also, I want to check out that that dong necklace. Sperm road. That's the silk road for people trying to get pregnant. It's <laughs> it's the super secret uh, track on Mario Kart 64 sperm there road. You go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. Uh, I'm more of a golden showers road kind of guy. <laughs> Nice bottom there, Randy. Yep. <laughs> you know. You, all you got to do is just, you know, go back and cut that out for Get yourself. It yourself and play yeah, it. Yeah. Just, that's all you got to do. All I got to do is fuck myself and it'll be, I'll be fucked. <laughs> God damn. All right, boys. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and let our hair down, kick our feet up, talk about what we've been watching this week. Hey, gang. What you been watching? Randy, what you been watching? Um, yeah, my uh, list is not going to seem so different from last week. Um, still kind of slowly picking away at Fargo season one. It was a kind of a crazy week, so we didn't get very far. I think we've got like one more episode under our belt. Um, still plugging away at Kentucky Route Zero. I'm still not entirely sure how I feel about that that game overall, but it is very unique and it's definitely artsy. So go for that if that's what you like, I suppose. Um I finally watched The Apology. Um, fuck, I got to look up. Oh, yeah, the Christmas one. Yeah, which I didn't actually realize or remember, I guess, um, was a Christmas film. But Beck picked it out. I was like, oh, maybe this one will be good. So we checked it out. It's not bad. It's it's kind of pulpy. It's it's kind of pulpy. But like Anna Gunn and Janine Garofalo are both in it. And I think they do a pretty good job. Like they're, Anna yeah, Gunn is like too. a proven talent, obviously. And Janine playing in a non-comedic role. I just haven't seen that very much. She did a reasonably good job. She was kind of not the straight man of the two. Um, and she's not in it all that much, but I don't know. There's, um, I think it was like a fun watch. I don't know that it's much of a repeater. It's just kind of like, it's like pulp novel stuff to me, which is has its place. It's just not something I, I necessarily gravitate towards. Um, the Christmas, Christmassiness though was pretty on point. I thought it looked pretty Christmassy as far yeah. as, our range of quote unquote Christmas movies goes <laughs> where a fucking the presence of a fir tree of any kind is qualifies it as a Christmas film. Just a little um, bit of snow on the ground. Or they God. actually say in the film, it's Christmas. Oh yeah. They say that in a movie that has nothing to do with Christmas. Therefore Christmas film. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, 
Yeah, Royal Rumble is the last thing on my list. But I went over to a friend's place nice. and watched the Royal Rumble last, last night. This is all very much in the wake of some very disturbing shit coming oh, out. Oh, the uh, Royal dude, Rumble. Yeah. I thought you meant like the film Royal Rumble. I was like, oh, no, damn. no. Okay, sorry, never. I should be clear. I watched the WWE event last night. Gotcha. Uh, and, and had a great time watching it. Like, I was really like, like the Royal Rumble is just so fun to get into. And I was watching it with. Um, a buddy of mine who's very, very immersed in wrestling and one of his friends that is also, and they were annotating it a little bit to myself, um, who's like kind of a lapsed fan of wrestling, uh, very lapsed fan in wrestling. And then a bunch of people that are very, very not in the wrestling world. So it was, it was just kind of fun to see like people's reactions from different ends of the spectrum of interest to begin with. Um, but it was a lot of fun, man. I don't know. I really like the, um, the ladies rumble I, like two years in a row i've enjoyed that more uh, not knowing a lot of the male characters now kind of leaves them on pretty le- level playing fields for me so i'm like just but kind of being introduced to these characters in both cases all the way through it for those who don't know it's like a 30 man fucking wrestling match and there's a male and a female edition of that every year nowadays and uh i don't know the women were more high flying to me they were having it was more fun um yeah that's really about it i don't have anything else worthy of note here so how about you juice what do you got on your what you've been watching list well the first one i want to mention is one that was recommended to me by dan um on our uh episode of the conversation and it was a movie called kill list which is a british horror film which was fucking cool um it came out in 2011 and I would echo that recommendation now because it was um, it's weirdly enough. It was directed by the same guy who I think last year directed the Meg Deuce, which I heard was oh, hot garbage. But this was like one of his first films. I don't think his first his second film, maybe, but um, it's a lot more low budget. I think maybe he wrote it, too. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. But anyways, it was cool. It was a wild film that I couldn't. It's one of those twists and turn movies that you just have no idea where it's going. And then it ends and you're like, what the fuck? And then you're thinking (laughs) about it and looking shit up about it. And like, what is going on? It was wild. It was really wild. Um, It does take a little bit of time to pick up, stick with it. Like, you know, it's going, it really is going somewhere, somewhere great. So just stick with it. Um, I'm the same director of escape from tomorrow. I don't know what that is. The 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 movie that's famous for being filmed inside Disney World. Oh, is it Ben? I didn't ben know Wheelie that. He's one of the co directors of that. I didn't realize. I didn't, that. I didn't know that Damn. either. His name is Ben Wheelie, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I didn't I realize that either. Hmm. Like that movie. Oh. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um uh I am continuing on my Studio Ghibli uh run and I watched The Wind Rises, which I really like. A lot less fantastical, more grounded. Um, and again, another one about fucking World War II or like right before World War II, which, um, they either have these like grand fantasy adventures or really depressing World War II stories, apparently. Uh, but it was good. <laughs> I really liked it. It focuses on an engineer who's designing airplanes that they're, they want to use like in the war or whatever, but it was, it was beautiful and sad, of course. Um, and I watched Ponyo, which was very cute. Definitely like the cutesiest of them. It does have some amazing animation, though. There's this one scene where it's the tsunami and it's like the waves are these fish and they're it's it's beautiful. It looks amazing, uh, but I, I liked it. Um, it's essentially kind of like the Little Mermaid in, in a lot of ways and kind of Pinocchio mixed, I guess. But um. Very cutesy, beautiful animation, and had a good had a good vibe. I liked it generally. Um, and then one thing that I was not able to watch because apparently I'm out of my mm-hmm. mind and it doesn't exist. So to give a little context, I've been on this Allison Chains kick a little bit, and somehow I clicked on this link one day of uh, the the lead singer from Bush singing wood as a cover and since then i will then get suggestions for bush songs so there was another one of uh recently he did um stephen colbert show where he did a new rendition of glycerine or whatever um so i watched that and as soon as i saw it i was like oh man pronounce it as in the song well i know i know (laughs) but it's just so 
I was like, oh shit, I gotta check out that weird Al parody of this song because I love that shit when I was younger. Fucking idiot. Dude went to YouTube, okay, to look up because the version that I have is in my mind, like I, these lyrics are in my mind of don't let the glaze go dry, crispy cream is how it goes. Like, don't let the days go by, glycerin. Don't let the glaze go dry, crispy cream. So I go to, I type in Weird Al, Krispy Kreme, nothing. So I was like, okay, Weird Al, <laughs> Glycerin, um, parody, nothing. Weird Al, I was like, fresh. And I was like, oh shit, did he not have a video for this? I could have sworn I saw a video. So then I go to Google, nothing. So I then I type in, here's what's really weird about it. I type in the lyrics and I'm like losing my mind now. I'm like full Mandela effect. I'm like, dude, I have heard this song. I lo- I liked this song. I type in those lyrics specifically and like two searches come up with that. Where one person was saying like, ha ha ha, my friend m- totally misheard the lyrics and typed that exact line out. And then one other thing that like pulled up that but had nothing to do with that. And I was like, what is happening right now? It is the only time where I f- truly feel like a Mandela effect. Like this I am not, not that meme. I am not clever enough to make those lyrics or to just have that song in my head. I don't know what is happening. It's freaking me out. So if anyone in any way has ever thought that Weird Al had a parody of Glycerine where he's talking about Krispy Kreme donuts, please message me because I'm losing my mind right now. It's crazy. It sounds to me, so like I I never heard this song or thought that it Mm -hmm. existed in any way, but it sounds to me like something that like, you know, in the schoolyard, kids would just like sing random shit like that that would be inspired by Weird Al kind of lyrics. Maybe, but I just don't Maybe that got ingrained in your head. Specifically, like, can hear it. I maybe. Here's my theory. It's something similar to Bob's. There's two two things I could imagine. One is we grew up in the era of Napster. Did you ever Napster? Because every song parody that was ever recorded and put on Napster was labeled as Weird Al. Not, well, well, not, we. okay, not Weird Al. I, like, I had, like, Weird Al albums and, like, like, uh, uh, soundtracks mm-hmm. that would have a weird Al song on them. Mm-hmm. But, but I'm just I, don't, asking, like, I don't remember. I don't ever specifically remember Napstring and having that song on like a mixtape that I made. Because sure, at sure, that but... point I was making like Mudvayne and Slipknot mixtapes. <laughs> not like weird. Oh, yeah. I, at, by that time Napster had come out, I was kind of like in the that era of making mixtapes. Well, the core the core of the Mandela effect is is like people misremembering their formative years sure. in some way. And so I, I I could see that. Like I, I remember hearing a fucking Mambo number no. five parody where it was Bill Clinton listing the women he slept with and it was labeled as <laughs> weird. Just, to be, yeah, so, to be yeah, to be it's just Napster. weird that there's like, no search of it though. I was I was anticipating like, oh, did I misremember this is weird on this is like totally something and there's just it doesn't exist. Well, so here's my other theory that I think holds more water and is really really because I know you, I think that this is very possible. I think it's very possible that on one uh, senior skip day or early morning donut run or some what? shit with some friends, you fucked around in the car, came up with this thing. Is like that's as good as Weird Al would come up that's, with. And that's probably two, yeah. Are that, the only yeah. two parts that still <laughs> very possible. That is very possible. <laughs> man, that was a kick-ass song he made. Yeah, <laughs> man, he's, he's the man. Best. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough, yeah. But if anybody else is on that level and you get anybody else was in the car that day, let me know. That's that is our audience. People that are in the car with us in the car, right? Anyways, Bob, what you been watching, my guy? Did you watch something? Oh, Oh, hi. Yeah, I watched a couple things. Um, American fiction. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I got out to the theater and saw that film. It is uh nominated for uh an Oscar for best for movie of the year, I believe uh, maybe some other ones. That's the one I, the only one that I can remember offhand right now. Um, I didn't really know anything going into it. It's um, it's very much like a darker comedy. I thoroughly fucking enjoyed it and highly recommend watching it. If you get the chance to do so. Uh, it's about this uh, black author and he, uh, he he's written several novels that have done well, but they're not like super popular. He's not selling 
um, like a ton of copies and some of his colleagues are finding more success than he is. And they're writing these books about um, young black folks uh, growing up in like difficult situations. And they're, they're written in, in ways that are, that are not like, I guess um, the, the way like a professor would write They're They're more like sort of, sort of common, common tongue, and he sort of like looks down on these books, even though they're like selling like wildfire and he just needs money to help his family out. So he writes one of one of these books and he uses a pseudonym and it fucking blows up and it's like nominated mm -hmm. for like a book of the year and like all this crazy stuff. And can, it just a real candy man situation there. huh? <laughs> oh, totally. It it leads to a uh, funny fucking shit. It's really it's really quite funny. Is it's also like a comedy. Like it's it's I got like the impression a, that was way more like dramatic. Than, it than so comedy, it's like half and half, I guess I would say. Okay. So um, it's got a lot of like really heartfelt like family drama kind of stuff happening too. Um, I, I but it is funny. I, I was kind of surprised at how hard it had me laughing, but it's, it's got a lot of heart, a ton of heart. It's just I love it, that Jeffrey. Really Wright. good. He's a fucking great actor. Yeah, yeah he is. It's also got. Such a small role, but Keith David is also in it for Fuck like a minute. Keith David, yeah, Hell yeah. Boy doesn't miss. Doesn't no. miss. No, really enjoyed that. Definitely check it out if you get the chance. Um, I also watched Dumb Money on Netflix, which is a movie like a movie sort of Retta. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who okay, that is. Continue. Maybe it's it's a retelling of the whole. Um, Game oh, yeah, stock it's... stock option exploding thing that happened a few years ago, and it's um, it's got Paul Dano. He plays like the main the main guy in it. Seth Rogen is in it. Uh, some other folks that you recognize. Uh, it's definitely like a, a funny retelling of this. It's it's got some decent comedy. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I did like after it ended. I find I found myself wanting more like i wanted them to go like deeper into the finances and how everything like worked and stuff but um overall it's a solid like netflix watch i i did i did enjoy my time with it uh finally i watched roadhouse for the first time the the original roadhouse with patrick we're hunting for dick. it's fine it is okay blasphemy bob i know bob, people gonna, apparently you're gonna catch all to, to be honest shit, i've never seen roadhouse either I've people love it. it. I like it fine. I kind of am in the same camp, honestly. Like, yeah. I feel like it's one of those Not movies. Like dirty like dancing. Mini. Like, if like you saw it, at a, it yeah. if you saw it at a certain time in your life, it probably means a lot more to you than it did to me seeing yeah. it later. Yeah, that's, that's gonna be like that. down the road. That's gonna be like Iron Man or right. the first Avengers movie. People are gonna be like, mm, yeah, it was all right, but it's like, eh, mm. kind of had to be there. That's how cult classics are formed a lot of the time. It's just like, yeah, yeah right place, right and, time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like my boy Frankie, my boy Frankie. My boy Frankie. <laughs> I didn't um, it, like it was a fun watch. Like I had a good time when I was watching it, but it's like it's ridiculous and silly, and like yeah. it, it's fine. It, um, I will say like Sam Elliott shows up, and this is, I mean Ooh. he's he's still like salt and pepper in it, but he's a younger Sam Elliott, and he is hmm. the coolest motherfucker I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he is so fucking cool in this movie. It's ridiculous. So you so um, psyched for that Gyllenhaal? So yeah, in that <laughs> I watched the trailer for that remake and Jake Gyllenhaal kicks ass. Like I really he's a great actor, but I don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know about that remake. I, I think he just like kind of he kind of does a, a Nick Cage level of just like sort of going out there and trying out a project. When yeah. he's good, he's fucking great. And when he's just working, he's just working. <laughs> like, yeah, I do like, I'm sure they fucking wrote him a check, son. But I do oh, like yeah. they they changed the setting from like, you know, middle of nowhere, Texas to like the Florida Keys. That'll be like an interesting setting, I guess, at least. But it's got uh, that McGregor guy in it. And like, I don't give a, oh, a no. fuck about that dude oh, at all. Oh, like, no. I don't know much about him, but yeah. That doesn't sound good. Yeah, I mean, it for didn't... a movie that's about like just meat hitting meat, dudes punching and kicking each other, like, meat that, on that's meat. fine. He is he is a side just of going to hit some meat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hit some meat with my meat. I was informed last night that uh, at least on a couple of occasions, wrestling fans have seen two large men battling it out. 
and uh, started chanting just the word meat, and I find that very, very great. God damn. <laughs> That's meat. a meat oh, cute meat. right there. Meat, meat, meat. God damn. <laughs> just that... taking everything down to its most basic. I love it. That's that is like yeah. Just that's the devolution of man. two I love men, it. two giant <laughs> men, just hug each other. Look at this meat. <laughs> Slap hams. <laughs> Damn. Well, that's all I've been watching. Um, let's go ahead and get into our last segment of the evening, which is of course our hotline screams. Hotline. Meat, 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 meat. meat. Here we go. That is insane, dude. <laughs> um, if you guys are listening, would like to call and leave a voicemail to be featured on next week's show. Hit, hit us up at 904-638-3231. We do have one voicemail this week. We're going to be hearing from our friend, the librarian. Let's hear what she's got to say. Hey, boys. Um, I just wanted to call and complain about some bullshit I just endured. So, it's about 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm reading in bed as per usual when suddenly I got a pee, so I do my business. And as I'm walking back into my room, I banged my fucking pinky toe on the door frame and I cracked my nail. But, luckily, my pinky toe kind of deformed, so there was barely a toenail to begin with. But it still hurt. Anyway, um... Yeah, there's some free feet content because I know Tarantino is listening. So, y'all have a good one. Bye! I really like that we've... That our call-in is just <laughs> complaints about people's day. I love that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> so, fine with me. Yeah, call in. Call in with your low-level complaints about uh, random happenstance in your life. It's my favorite. I want to no, just does suck. general status update on everybody's feet. Let me know. Tell us about your toes. <laughs> How are they? We want to hear. Uh, well, well and some of us want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you don't have to get it amputated there, the librarian. That's, yeah, that sucks. Uh, oh, that's one of those pains you could just feel. You know, yeah. you're like, ah. I had to propose to Beck when they were on a fucking. A uh, knee scooter because they decided to try and kick a ball to the dog <laughs> with shoeless in the yard and broke a toe. Oh damn! So yeah, that shit does suck. There's no yeah. question, dude. I broke my big toe in your old apartment, Randy. In That's my right. I freshman year, it's yeah. on camera of high school. Yeah, I uh, trying to. <laughs> this is so I stupid. Even... Oh, this is so stupid. I just <laughs> remembered so, what it it's was. It's so stupid. Um, it was one of our buddies was like, Hey man, just kick me in the nuts right now. And I was like, are you, are you, are you serious? We were filming like, things for, for laughs. Yeah. And of like, course this Jack is ass. prime Jack time. Ass Jack ass shit. Ass yeah. And he was like, so, yeah, kick, kick me in the nuts. And I was like, okay, you're like a hundred percent serious. Like this is, a, put, we're going to be okay over his dick. So it wasn't going to hurt. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> so I didn't have a shoe on. I went to go kick him in the nuts and he was sort of like, you know, sidestepped at the very last second. And I kicked him right in the kneecap. Oh, and no. you can just hear my toe crack. We have that crack on, on record, on record. <laughs> I could watch Damn. that on VHS right and, now. And then I had to go to band camp the next day. That's <laughs> in like oh, March fuck. with a broken toe. It wasn't great. It's a snap, man. It's a real snap. That's yeah, just dude. Yeah. So ah. call in and tell us about your toe. Yeah. Let us know. How are your feet doing? <laughs> 904-638-3231. We're going to be back next week with a brand new show per usual. Uh, oh, wait, be... call in with your Mandela effects, please. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. Is that's there anything a, else? Do you have any, like, uh, unique Mandela effects, or do you, is there one that you just swear by that's, like, pretty popular? But I'm kind of curious about, like, really unique, like, my Krispy Kreme mm -hmm. situation going on here. Yeah, yeah. Hit us up. Let us know about your false memories, because yeah, you're let's... old. Let us know. <laughs> call in and tell us about, about your about slipping the... mind. Yeah. <laughs> tell us about your faulty cerebrum. Well, yeah. that can be me. I mean, I'm only 23. So. <laughs> Can't be me. <laughs> Let us know. 904-638-3231. Uh, My yeah, next has something to tell you. Next week, we're going to be talking about the winner of the February poll, which 
currently seems to be from beyond from 1986. Until Byzantium shoots to the top last minute. Man, I hope not because I'm gonna watch From Beyond pretty soon. So well, that really wait till Thursday. Shit on... Wait till Thursday. Yeah, I've had that shit on 4K for like two years and still haven't cracked it yet. Why not do you sound years, like Bob? Year. I know, I know. The man what a loser! Physically and otherwise. <laughs> you said it, Bob. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Check out From Beyond. Get ready for next week's show. Until then, if you want to find us on social media, just search Straight Chilling Podcast. We will pop right up. If you want to join in in our daily Slack channel conversations, we talk about the movie of the week. We talk about TV shows. We got a, a True Detective channel created. We're talking about the new season. We trade recipes. We share pictures of our pets. It's wholesome. It's good fun. Just uh, let us know in one of those social media outlets if you want to join in, and I'll send you a link so you can do so. And until next week, as always, all you mother truckers, please keep chilling. I can smell a beaver from 30 miles away. Beaver! Beaver!